Hello and welcome to Barn Blog. And today I'm here with James of Pro Cult Friends and Luke, friend of Pro Cult. Um, Hi, Derek. Uh, Long time listener, first time caller. Uh, thank you. Um, <laughs> Hello, again. Good to be back. Yes. And it's good to have our British friends back in so much that I have any British friends. Actually, I have quite a few. They tend to enjoy my slugging on their country. Um, but. Today we're talking about British Trotskyism, and the reason why I wanted to talk about it is that after the 1990s, uh, my thesis was um, that if you look at the trends of American Trotskyism, the British currents seem to come in and uh, out-dominate the American companies, particularly the ISO, and it's kind of interesting and complicated relationship to the S to the socialist workers party in great Britain. Um, whereas the other parties that could claim a legacy directly to James Cannon start to really disappear are, or even if they do have a direct line, like the American ISO does um, it, it, it's uniqueness to the U S and like Shackmanite thought, et cetera, goes away. Uh, there's a lot more push of of uh, Tony Cliff, et cetera. And then you have the militant tendencies and the grantite tendencies that come in, um, mostly from Canada, and kind of grow here as well. And in fact, uh, the, the international Marxist tendency is probably the only uh, Trotskyist tendency that has a significant identity outside of um either just becoming a purely anti-revisionist party like the WWP or the PSL or a being subsumed into the DSA. Although I make the somewhat controversial statement that I see the DSA is also a post Trotskyist phenomena. Um, so that, however, leads us to an, an interesting problem that we talked a little bit about before show, and I want to give you a chance to articulate, is when I did the research on this, I found that most of the comparisons between Trotskyists in Europe and Trotskyists in America before the 1990s was between French Trotskyists and, and American Trotskyists, not British ones. And I was confused by this because my historical frame of reference is that we always just listen to the British, particularly the British Trotskyists. I mean, we don't tend to, who knows what the classical uh, Communist Party of Great Britain ML thinks, but, um, and we've never really cared about that. But the SWP has had a disproportionate influence on American leftist culture, because even though the ISO left the IST and there was a split with the SWP, uh, um, that Tariq Ali um, basically the new left review and the and the I and the I uh, SWP's influence on stuff like the ISO's theoretical line or haymarket books, etc., meant that they were really dominant as voices to the left here, particularly in the 90s and 2000s. Um, and that like I said, the other tendencies also came from Britain, but I don't really know outside of kind of the great man history of people like Ted Grant and, T and Tony Cliff and Alan Woods much about um, British Trotskyism. And I think we're going to get into why uh, today. So what are the origins of Trotskyism in Britain? Um, so the origins of Trotskyism in Britain come from the Revolutionary Communist Party in 1939, which was a very, very small um, group, which was a split from the, the Communist Party of Great Britain, but it wasn't a particularly impressive split. It had a stronghold in East London and was able to organise during the war, particularly um, low wage um disorganized workers, particularly service workers. So they, they organized an occupation of the Ritz Hotel, for example. Um, <clears throat> but they were never a, a mass force. They were kind of alone in not signing a, uh, figuratively, not signing a peace pact with the bourgeoisie during the, the Second World War, but they weren't really able to take advantage of that to build a mass movement. Uh, the RCP folded, I believe, in the late 40s, um, largely under pressure of a, a growing communist party and a, a big surge for, for Labour, Labour becoming the kind of hegemonic party of post-war governance. 
and a few of their members were involved in something called uh, The Club, which was little more than, than that. It was a club. Some people in there were involved in, in Labour Party politics. Some people in there were involved in, in extra parliamentary politics. And of course, as, as time goes by, there are all of these kind of splits and mergers of little groups breaking away and then coming together, either back with the original kind of club formation or with, with other small, small splinters. British Trotskyism really gets its growth spurt in the 1960s. Um, again, not as a response to the, the, the failures of the pro-Soviet CP. Um, no matter how badly the, the, the CPGB did, it seemed to have very little impact on how the Trotskyist groups grew, even after the disastrous Hungarian events, when 10 or 12,000 people left the Communist Party, only about 200 joined any given uh, Trotskyist group. Um, so the real impetus for growth was actually the breakdown of, of, of colonialism and particularly the, the war in Vietnam um, and the, the brutality of American engagement in that, where it became clear that there needed to be a political articulation around anti-imperialism, around anti-racism, with race and racism becoming a much bigger problem uh, within British cities, or at least becoming much more apparent to, to young people who lived there. Um, problems of women's oppression coming to the forefront and kind of so on and so forth. Um, the Trotskyist movement then went on to have particularly awkward relationships with anti-imperialism, anti-racism uh, and women's liberation through the 70s and 80s. Um, but we'll, we'll put those to one side. Uh, there was the, the, high yeah. point of, the high point of Trotskyism in Britain came in the middle of the 1980s um, with the miners' strike um, and just predating the anti-poll tax movement. At that point, Trotskyism had maybe 25,000 organized party members across all Trotskyist parties. Now, depending on who you listen to, that's somewhere between seven and 20,000 fewer than were just organized in the Communist Party at the same time. So this was, even at its height, a an obviously minority movement of the British left. The relation that you speak of, this kind of idea that our American brothers and sisters have, that British Trotskyism was the serious radical political movement which saved them really comes from an historical accurate uh, an historical accident which only makes sense if you're around 40 years of age in america which i think many of uh, uh many of the people who speak on this quite a lot are after the fall of the the soviet union and the break apart of the british communist party the number of trotskyists in britain the size of the the trotskyist movement if we want to say that went down dramatically, it more than halved within 10 years. However, weirdly, one group, the Socialist Workers' Party, was able to grow amongst that, that smaller number. So by the time we get to the mid-90s, the SWP has around 10,000 members of the 12,000 active Trotskyists in Britain. Now, it got those members through two ways. One was it was able to position itself to take in all the people who would have previously, the last generation, joined the Communist Party and now had no Communist Party to join. Secondly, it stripped itself of all vestiges of Trotskyism. Right. Its policy at this point was we go into, you know, the anti-globalization movement, the women's movement, the students movement, and we don't push a political line. We just go in as the best organizers. And then when everybody goes, shit, you guys are good at organizing protests, we go, well, we learned it through this party. Do you want to join? That was an incredibly successful tactic for a while before everybody realized that actually they were um, they were being pulled into something that they were, hadn't been told they were being pulled into. Um, and so the numbers started to decline. But it was a very specific moment in time where, from your analysis, Derek, as I understand it, American Trotskyism was weak, was looking for any kind of symbol around the world of a vibrant, radical left-wing movement. We happened to speak the same language. We had what looked like a mass party, even in a declining movement. And thus we became, from a distance, sort of the, uh, the Beatrice to your Dante, if that makes sense. Right. Well, one of the things that happened in the United States is the the CPUSA, which you know it's got a long and storied history, completely collapses in the sixties and seventies. So, I mean, you see a drop from uh, eighty thousand members to about fifty thousand members to about five thousand members in in, in twenty years, um, and that's before the fall of the USSR. After the fall of the USSR, it seems completely irrelevant. It's only become even a peripheral force in American politics the way it is now in the last five years. Like it, uh, it, it, its growth seems to be predicated on reaction against the DSA. Hmm. Um, the, 
the American Socialist Party also broke up in the 60s, but uh, most of the Trotskyists seem to actually have gone into into that are our are it's going to be confusing because these acronyms are don't overlap our revolutionary communist party is maoist and um uh our uh socialist workers party is um hyper defensist maybe some people might even call stalin a felic uh <laughs> uh uh trotskyist and then we have our marcyite tendency which is which at this point is no longer differentiable from Marxist Leninism proper. Um, in fact, maybe more extreme on their on their defense of Stalin. <laughs> um, <laughs> so you, you know it, the, but a lot of this is a recent development. Um, until the the uh, sexual assault scandals that rocked both the SWP UK and then later the US. And concurrently, the million-dollar publishing business that was built on top of it that finally made it actually an actionable thing to deal with. Um, the ISO had a disproportionate, and I, I say this because I don't. I, I think the largest they ever were was five thousand people. Like um, they had a disproportionate pull on both organizing and on left-wing media um, and books and for the same reasons you said, had a uh, had a tie to the Cliffite tendency. But it was very much similar strategy where you entered on the alter-globalization movement, you entered in the American anti-war movement. Um, and once you got in, you would entice people with altusser, which has nothing <laughs> to do with Trotskyism, but it's true. And then you give them Tony Cliff. And a lot of the people in that movement were utterly confused by it because it was like, wait, I don't like, I, I like Trotsky. Sure. But I don't know anything about these tendencies. Um, and you see that when the, when the, when the ISO collapsed, it fragmented in a bunch of pieces, a lot of which did not stay remotely Trotskyist, even when they entered say, the DSA, because there's several post ISO factions in the DSA, but there's also like a lot of Altusarian Marxist Leninists. I think one of the things that's different is the collapse of Marxist Leninism in the United States uh, is earlier than in than in Britain. Um, I don't know how a serious of a, a force they ever really were in Britain either. Um, and one of the questions I have to ask you guys that I don't know is uh maoism seems to have been more important in the u.s uh than yeah. it was in britain very definitely um like yeah <laughs> so, um, yeah. Maoists, what, historically. what are the reasons what are the reasons for that um i think it's probably to do with the first maoist um kind of splits we had and how those manifested themselves so the Maoist splits that we had actually emerged through the trade union organizing sections mm -hmm. of the, the Communist Party, which meant that instead of it being a broad split across the party on a question of imperialism, that was understood as a question of imperialism, it became a regional one um, and incredibly sectorally concentrated. So what you had is whole branches leaving the party um, in Again, Southeast London, uh, in certain parts of East Yorkshire, I believe in Nottinghamshire as well. And they were all auto workers in the same union. And largely what held them together was loyalty to this guy called Reg Birch, who was this um, this very, uh, very brave, actually very influential um, uh, auto union organizer. And so there wasn't, it was experienced as a split within the trade union element, as opposed to a split on the question of imperialism. And I think that that's probably an accident. That split could have happened any number of other ways, but that contained it and stopped it from spreading. Also, Maoism in Britain was, as, as I suppose it probably was in America, was highly linked to the students movement. Yes, mm -hmm. it was. So, so slightly later, um, so that occurred in like uh, 59, early 60s, something like that. Um, later, when you have those splits going around, around the Vietnam War, um, we did not have the same 
we had a vibrant student movement in Britain and we had a growing number of people going to universities, but it wasn't like the US where you had, um, you know, the college opened up to all of these people who'd served in the forces, um, which I think, um, so I, I think that that kind of boomed out a little bit and allowed that to take on the, the, the idea of a very significant politics. Also, the, the number of universities uh, in Britain at this point were largely concentrated in the larger cities where the Maoists kind of melded into the rest of the left. So it wasn't that you have this, this kind of big booming student population, which creates a new political tendency. It was, there have always been weird kind of factions of the left in London or Manchester or Glasgow. Um, mm. And now there's, here's a few extra weird ones and people, you know, would often be attracted towards other elements when they got radicalized at university. I know that's an unsatisfying answer. Um, I don't think there's like a silver bullet reason, but those are some of the things that play into it, I think. Uh, yeah, the the Maoist factions of the, of the American communist movement were able to take a really big role um, in the students for democratic society so before the dsa that's and and after the the u.s socialist party that's the largest it's not even truly a socialist movement either so that's part of the issues with it um there are a lot of trotskyists who are highly involved in that most famously hal draper but but even a lot of the traditions that get formed like monthly review or like trotskyist Ma maoist hybrid traditions and and whatnot which you don't see at all and that's kind of an America only phenomenon as far as I can tell. Um, uh, so I, I find that that interesting and it my, it maps with what I experienced here. Um, but I guess that does leave us to kind of getting uh, you know one of the reasons why the Maoist movements were better positioned to handle it, is even though they were also fractious in fact they probably split even more than Trotskyists do this but um, is that uh, as a tendency, they were much more nebulous in their in their political differences, whereas in the United States, by the time of of the students' movement, the ideological fracture lines within Trotskyism are hard. They're, they've been they've been solidified mostly in responses to the fifties and, and early sixties. So, and there's no way to bridge them. Like. Um, and they just continue to grow. So basically every new event leads to another split. But by this point, like the Shackmanites and I, I believe even the Spartacists and all that have already left. Um, but but it is interesting. I guess, you know, the dominance of the SWP is is telling. But I, I want to ask you, why do you think that the the, I, the international Marxist tendency has held on so strongly? Like. <laughs> Um, strongly being not very strong, but it, 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 it seems to actually be able to survive these changes, even if it isn't particularly growing. So I think, James, you and I have slightly different views on this, don't we? So do you want to do you want to come in with yours? Um, no, you go first. I, wanna, I can't can't quite recall your reasons. <laughs> so, I mean, I think the the IMT has held on largely through political cowardice. Um, so. It organizes in Britain, um, if by the IMT we're talking about, oh, sorry, the IMT or the IMG? The IMT. The, For the military West, tendency. Yeah. Well, okay, the sorry. Grantites. That's... Yeah, so there are two loads of Grantites. There's the IMT and the IMG, and I struggle to match the international acronym with the uh, with the party acronym. The in militant tendency in America is represented by SALT. The militant tendency in uh, I mean, the the other the non-militant tendency of Grantites is represented by the IMT here, and right. I believe they go under the same name elsewhere. But I don't always know. Yeah. So, so. the so the the the, um, the Grantite IMT, as opposed mm -hmm. to the what previously was the International Marxist Group, now the Committee for a Workers International. Right. Um, so the the IMT, who in Britain go under the name of Socialist Appeal, um, mm -hmm. neither socialist nor appealing, if you ask me. But that's my my dirty sectarianism for the day um so they organize a effectively small group of students within the labor party that's what they do now you're always going to find 
Labour Party students who want to say, hey, actually, I'm a, a, a revolutionary socialist, but I don't, I'm not going to threaten party unity. And that's a kind of fairly deep, um, I think, identity thing for a lot of young leftists who want to be part of a mass movement, but also want to feel that they are themselves, um, you know, revolutionaries, that they're in the mass movement, but so far beyond it because they've, you know, they go to these reading groups or they go to these meetings or something like that. Um, and that, I think, keeps the IMT going, basically. I think there's always a, a new lot of recruits for it. I know a number of people who have been in and out of the IMT through their time at university. It's not an organization that holds on to people when they leave campus. So an ex-partner of mine was um, was in the IMT during her master's year, and then she she moved to a different uh, a different city, and then there was no yeah you know, there was no temptation to stay involved in it. It served its purpose. It was a um, a, a Marxist clique for Labour Party members in that particular uh, you know constituency Labour Party uh, branch. Um, and, and so, you know, really, it's just demand led with the IMT. I don't think there's anything particularly politically interesting that they do. Um, they have historically taken a, a, a more, um, I, I suppose, to my mind, a more kind of straightforward and sensible line on anti-imperialist politics than a lot of the other Trotskyist groups. But I'm not, I think that's probably muscle memory rather than it is. Uh, something which gets them a bunch of members and entrenches them in communities. What is their line on anti-imperialism exactly? Cause... So they, they have an old kind of Trotskyist line um, arguing that imperialism is constituted by a combined and uneven development and as such should be treated as both a political and an economic um, phenomenon. And if you want to do anti-imperialist politics, you also have to target, um, you know, basically the, uh, the private firms, cartels, financial institutions, etc., which constitute yeah. um uh, that kind of uh, value stripping with so a no go ahead with a, with a modicum of support for um social democratic um projects in in like oppressed nations like venezuela for example as well okay so so ba different from the malice line which is that the political contradiction is actually more important than the economic one thus mm -hmm. uh as long as one is not supporting comprador bourgeoisie, one can support bourgeoisie, maybe even in the developed world, um, et cetera. Okay, that, 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 that's, that's consistent. How they grow in America and Canada is actually kind of interesting. My impression is that whereas the SWP spoke out of both ends of its mouth on quote liberal identity politics the imt is pretty open about opposing it um and so uh they tend to be the radical group that is skeptical of say liberal anti-racism uh as opposed to most of the social democratic groups that are are now we have MAGA communists and other weird shit like that but but in general as opposed to the SWP, which the SWP very much, I mean, excuse, the ISO, excuse me, not the SWP, um, the, I hate all these stupid acronyms. Um, the ISO very much had an internal external line where like externally they were super supportive and even sometimes took anti-workerist positions, but internally they often didn't. Um, and so, uh, and although that did seem to change right before their collapse, where they actually started taking the the, the somewhat worker skeptical lines, even internal. But it was often like a bait and switch, it felt like, by many people who, who told me when they got in to the ISO, that the way the ISO talked about this stuff in public versus the way it talked about it once you were in were very different. Um, and that seems to be similar to the SWP, the way you guys are describing it. So... I, I think that's right. Yeah. I mean, the other thing I would say is the slight difference in, in Britain, if we're talking about contrasting tendencies. So the IMT grant type lot are that they're not the second largest of the Trotskyist groupings in, in Britain or nominally Trotskyist groupings in Britain. Um, so the, the militant tendency split in the, uh, the late 80s, early 90s around a bunch of them getting expelled from the Labour Party. Mm -hmm. Now, the bunch that got expelled, who are the CWI guys committed for Workers International in Britain, um, the Socialist Party of England and Wales, an acronym which unfortunately spells spew, um, <laughs> they are considered... 
they vie with the SWP for being the largest Trotskyist grouping. They're usually in the minority, um, but they're considerably larger. Um, they are parliamentary road to socialism people with the occasional quote from Trotsky kind of thrown in. Um, I mean, the SWP aren't like proper Trotskyists either. Cliff rejects huge amounts of Trotsky's theory, uh, whereas at the SP guys, they just tend to kind of forget it. The Socialist Party, sorry, the um, Socialist Appeal are a little bit more stringent on it, but yeah. Yeah, so, so the IMT is pretty stringent here as well. Yeah. Um, but we have more Orthodox groups than them. Uh, they're just small now. Uh, I'm gonna let James. I'm just gonna let James give me his theory. I just wanted to like. I, I just want to add to that while it's still relevant, though. Salt was our second largest Trotskyist tradition. In fact, it may have even surpassed uh, the ISO. And Salt is uh, our 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 militant tendency faction, but it has collapsed uh, in the last five years from about five to five to six thousand members, and potentially had more. Uh, up on the beginnings of the Bernie campaign after the Kasama Swat campaign, down to about a thousand members, mostly, although not solely, around maintaining Kasama Swat's one seat at a city council, which he resigned. Um, and so they have now entered, split into both some people who are both in the DSA and in the uh, SALT, and people who are just in the DSA as a kind of militant aligned sub faction in the dsa but but the imt seems to be the last person standing of the british trotskyist tendencies here so james what's your what's your take on the on why the imt is still around <laughs> um i mean i don't disagree with luke on socialist appeal too much um mm -hmm. i think that's that's a fairly straightforward kind of social milieu that all trotskyist organizations in britain tend to recruit from and those who exclu exclusively recruit from it stay confined to it um, and that's more or less what kind of happens with socialist appeal. What's interesting to me is that they're much more successful drawing from that social basis and only that social basis than a lot of groups which draw from more eclectic social bases like from trade unions or from uh, kind of the occasional activists who will wander into things which is where more more kind of tasks get taken on than the primary task of organizational reproduction, which is literally all socialist appeal do. And then when those contradictions come into play, you end up with the hodgepodge mess that Luke was referring to earlier in the in the discussion, which I think is really the kind of core contradiction in British Trotskyism that we have these these organizations that play the role of doctrinaire, dogmatic organizational reproduction but also attempt to do trade union struggle, but also attempt to do um, en entryism into the Labour Party quite often, but also stand for election themselves, but then also do things like social movements. Um, the interesting thing for Militant, uh, the Socialist Party, the other half of the IMT split, is I actually think they've done the most with social movement politics in Britain of, I think, any Trotskyist organisation. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's really important to highlight and explains their longevity, because not only do they have a real record they can point to with things like involvement in the poll tax, they also became the bogeymen who were paraded around in the Labour Party, who were paraded around in the press, um, and therefore serve quite an attractive purpose in that role. Um, I also think they're the least scandal-ridden party in Britain. I may be wrong on that, but um, yeah, I think that that does play into the longevity there quite a lot, particularly given the dominance of scandal politics in determining um, more contemporary Trotskyist organisational development since the 2010s, um, and also the, the failure to kind of of Trotskyism to work within anti-racist or women's movements in, in kind of any substantial way which prefaces that. Um, so I think both of those things are really important to take into account when thinking about how the militant tendency has survived, but also how the SWP has survived, really. Um, those are kind of the core things that we need to hit on, is that social movement politics, and then how they use the other elements of their organization for organizational reproduction. That's an interesting difference, though, because we don't, like, the United States Trotskyist Movement did have a strong relationship to the unions, but their lack of relationship to the unions now has to do with just, like, our unions are even weaker than yours, like um, significantly so, actually. <laughs> um, and um, and in the 
government sector unions, no Marxist group has ever been strong. Um, and the government sector unions are the great majority of, of unions. Um, it's also kind of true that no Marxist group in America has ever been strong amongst working class unions, although Marxist organizers were the people who put them together. So it's a, the, the relationship is a little bit complicated. Um, and lastly, there's no way to do entryism in the United States without subsuming yourself directly to one party or another. You can't really be an independent faction, although the DSA is trying its damnedest. But um, so social movement politics is really the only way for militant groups to have an effect. And that's even going back to the CPUSA. I mean, one of the reasons why the CPUSA survived the Red Scare at all Um was that it was a major player in like um, African American politics, African American cultural politics? Uh, they, uh, the CPUSA, like almost every famous black writer that comes to the United States, if you see where they got their first paychecks, is from a CP, it's from a CPUSA. Uh, you like Arts Fund, are there a minor functionary in the party, and they're getting um, a, a, a close to middle class wage from that in the beginning? But most of them don't stay in the CPUSA after the '60s either. Um, so th that, that, that is a very different problem. So it's actually interesting that the contradictions we have tend to be more about just the contradictions in the social movement and the student movement and where it relates to the workers movement in general, that that plagues all the American communist movements. Whereas Trotskyism seems to be, Trotskyism in Britain actually seems to just look like the way leftism after the 1940s in general looks like in America. Um, is that I mean, a fair assessment or? Yeah, I mean, I think it's also fair to say that despite the fact that Britain, practically speaking, has no Trotskyist groups, we also only have Trotskyist groups. <laughs> um, in so far as, you know, the Cliffites aren't Trots in like a classical sense of the word, nor are um, the, the CWI guys. Um, but all of those kind of... Um, all of the, the stuff that we would say about a small sectarian group, which tends to get associated with Trotskyism in kind of classical 20th century Marxist literature, um, the, the kind of small bickeringness, the fetishization of um, tiny doctrinaire points, the missionary orientation, as in, you know, your job is to go into whatever this thing is and win these people to socialism through selling your newspapers, the power of your eloquence, kind of et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, that's now in Britain, you know, whether you're a Marxist-Leninist of whatever kind it is, or you're a Trotskyist, or you're an anarchist, or you're a Maoist, that's kind of all that you can do. So to a certain degree, we've ended up in the same place, right, in that all of the left reflects the problems of Trotskyism. Um, although you got there from a fact of all of the left had it, so therefore Trotskyists had it. Right. And we kind of got there from all the Trotskyists had it, and then the Communist Party fell apart. Um, mm -hmm. the organized left fell apart, the workers' movement went into a precipitous decline, and the only organizing model you have left, which is reproducible, is the old trot one, and so that's what everybody does. That uh, makes sense. I do think we need to possibly go into some of the demythologizing around Trotskyism and unions in Britain, and also Trotskyism and entryism, and the, the limits of that, um, because, yeah, I think it's correct that the US entryism is, has always kind of been off the table. Um, where, but in Britain, the results aren't too much different. Entryism's kind of only been on the table for the political opportunism of those within the Labour Party or for those within the Tory party who kind of want to mobilise the fact that entryism, entryism is happening within the party to create a reds under the bed kind of media scare and move forward with expulsions and so on and so forth um, and move forward with tight, imposing tighter party policy internally um, and being able to take exceptional political action that they wouldn't without the excuse. Um, and the most that entryism has ever achieved in Britain is really the Liverpool City Council in the 1980s um, under Thatcher, um, which was able, to, which was militant um, and was able to, you know, attempt to stop passing budgets and so on and so forth, but then was was expelled and kicked out of the Labour Party and involved, was in part of that purge. And that is the most that's ever been 
managed and it was a standoff in local politics rather than kind of any attempt to redefine Labour Party policy rather than any attempt to actually take power over the Labour Party. That social basis has never happened. What entryism tends to actively mean is a brief moment every electoral cycle where every, it's tro every Trotskyist organization sets aside their difficulties for a moment and joins in canvassing for the Labour Party and, again, gives up everything that makes them definitionally Trotskyist in that moment in order to pursue a different political project, which in this part, point of, um, is pushing social democracy. Within the unions, it's a little bit different, and I do think Trotskyist politics occur quite a lot in British unions still, but what we're looking at is um, John Kelly, uh, the book me and Luke, one of the books me and Luke read through for this, uh, gives quite an interesting like look at this. But we're looking at like one or two organisers from a specific Trotskyist organisation ever getting elected within any kind of trade union bureaucracy and therefore serving a function within the unions, being able to draw people to the organisation to a degree within the unions, but ultimately being isolated politically unless they cooperate either with other Trotskyists or with other trade union officials, and therefore not really being able to do that much politically. So it's an anchoring point. It's a thing that you can say and show and, you know, be like, we work in the unions, we're part of the workers' movement, and so on and so forth. But it's not something that's ever really produced any substantial results, which I think is important to understand. Um, because, like, one thing I think British Trotskyism does get the presentation of, and I can see how this would kind of happen internationally, is that it's actually affected some kind of change or represented a real social force and it simply never has is this because marxism's the strength of marxism in britain actually is a is a question that i've never actually had answered um and i've always gone back and forth on this um and one of the, the ironic things about the, the U.S. trots is they at least do have the founding of one pretty successful union, although one that they were purged from, uh, because all Reds were purged, um, in, the, in the 1930s with the foundation of the Teamsters. I mean, it's still one of the largest and relatively, I mean, I can tell you about Teamsters controversies, but relatively more militant unions. Um, it is plagued by associations with the mob in the 70s and, and and stuff like that but it it is a it is a real victory in trotskyist ironically however don't tend to claim it in the united states they tend to focus more on their social movement work um but one of the the ironies of american trotskyism is almost all of them want to found a workers party to entry it like that's kind of their strategy is we we must build it so we can enter it like it's um, let's do the most important job so we can go back to trying to influence it <laughs> right <laughs> like um we, we, we have exactly the same thing here um okay. and they nearly succeeded um mm. so there was a a group there was a party which i think at one point had 20 25 000 members uh called left unity which was basically um some ex-Labour people who were really pissed off with the Labour Party um, and all of, or not all, but most of the trot sects as entryists doing all of the work and pretending to people that they were social democrats, really. Um, it was it was very, very funny. Uh, I used to go to some of their socials because my, my friends were involved and it really was just people who I knew were Trotskyists pretending not to be um, when giving speeches. The real tragedy of left unity is it reached its peak about six months before Corbyn became leader of the Labour Party, at which point everybody just left, right? Because the people who left the LP were, it was because it, it wasn't, you know, quote unquote socialist enough. It wasn't a left wing social democratic party. And it was now, so they went back and all the trots left because finally there was something to try and do real entryism into. Um, so it's, 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 that occurs kind of all over the place. And I think that that is, I mean, look, I, I, I think me and James will be of the view that, um, you know, if there is a workers' party and you're um, a communist, you should probably try and be in it for as long as you can until its internal contradictions means that you you, you can't be anymore and you have to do something else. Um, however, the idea that you would kind of, as a small grouplet, attempt to will this thing into existence 
so that you can then will your way into its leadership instead of on its own terms. It just seems it's kind of absolute kind of fantasy. And I think it's, I think it's a kind of uniquely Anglophone one. Um, yeah, it's, it's also, I mean, it's not, Trotskyists are not the only people who attempted in the United yeah. States. I, I have actually called the neo Kalskyist movement the, the heirs to Trotskyism in America uh, because they effectively want to do the same thing, although their current strategy is to try to take over the DSA so it will separate formally from the Democratic Party and then try to build a later par party off of that and then overthrow the U.S. Constitution. But um, are they so, doing entryism into entryism now? Yes, that, that oh, my critique, my, my critique of uh, of cosmonaut, uh, which is which is not Marxist unity tendency, the uh, unity uh, unity group, they're not the same, but they overlap strongly. Was that you are to the you are to the DSA what the DSA is to the Democrats, and it's probably likely to work about as well. Um, uh, so, you know, um, but it, it see what is interesting. It, I think this still gives this this kind of allure of British dominance is American neo Kalskyism is a very incoherent thing. I, I, I agree with the neo Kalskyism and say it's not really a tendency because it's not. Um, but because also, you know, Bosch Carson Cara claims it, as does Eric Blank, as does most of the social Democrats who are you know progressive democrats in the in in the in in public view and their esoteric austrio marxists in private view but um they also claim neo kalskyism everybody wants to claim neo kalskyism because it either gives you the linen that's cool and you want to focus on early linen and maybe maybe last testament linen but we're going to skip the civil war and not really talk about that um or, or it gives you, oh, we have a politics going back to the Second International. We don't have to deal with this Lenin Soviet Union stuff anymore. We don't have to condemn it. We just don't have to deal with it at all. It's no longer a question. Um, and so that gives you two ways around that. Um, however, that's those are not the dominant trends. Those are, the, those are kind of the dominant intellectual trends. The actual organizing trends right now are, uh, we've seen the rebirth of, of MLism, but with no party to represent it here. There's no, there's not really a, a, a party. It's like a meme almost, um, which is a, a, a interesting thing to talk about. Our entryists that actually have happened have been in two social movements, which is the SDS and International Answer. Um, International Answer was started by a coalition of uh, uh, the International Action Center, which is not socialist necessarily at all. And the WWP, which is the original Marciite party, uh, which has pretty much foregone any formal relationship to Trotskyism at this point. Um, uh, it became represented by the PSL, which split with the WWP, although I'm not sure it was actually on ideological lines. It seems partly just about money. It wasn't. Uh, so me and Jim were actually in the sister organization of both the WWP and the PSL. Mm -hmm. Um and so we'd get reports basically uh, from, you know, meetings that our comrades had with, with their members when they visited London for whatever reason it was. And both sides were like, no, this is interpersonal. Right. This is purely interpersonal. Um, yeah, we might sort it out in future, but for the time being, them lot are wankers and I'm no talking to them. Um, and yeah, I, I remember um, people in our tendency, uh, James, I, 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 tell me if you remember this differently, were very much like, you know, this is ridiculous. Like, we, how do we have two sister organizations in the same country and no one in Europe likes us? What have we done wrong? Um, so, the Marciites uh, are, are interesting because in the United States, I, I no longer see them as a distinct tendency for Marxist Leninism at all. And if they are, they don't want you to know it either. <laughs> like, like uh, they're, they're kind of notorious for doing stuff like editing out uh, Marcy's relationship to Trotskyism from the, from the Wikipedia page. <laughs> so, um, that's fun. Um, but they've also seemingly kind of collapsed recently as well. Uh, here, they, they, they used to be much bigger deal. But all of this stuff seems to be tied into international answer and student movement entryism. They did not, there's been very little success 
when, when people have tried to enter into the Democratic Party, whether it be Gene Kwan from the Maoist section or the various partisan review people who had some relationship to Trotsky, uh, to Shackmanite Trotskyism in the in the fifties and sixties, they've just become Democrats or worse. Like they 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 have not maintained any kind of separate identity at all. Um, Bernie Sanders is the exception, and he doesn't come out of any of these milieus. Actually, like he's kind of his own thing. Um, so I guess that leads us to how I, two things seem to have happened that rocked British Trotskyism. One is left unity. Uh, two is there's this troubling association with British Trotskyism with George Galloway, which is a complicated thing. And I don't think Americans understand it. Um, and I say I don't think American understand it because I don't think I understand it. I don't think anyone understands it. If I'm okay. quiet. <laughs> okay. Well, good. Good. I feel better now. <laughs> I mean, it, it's also uh, no longer present. So right. Galloway's current far left bedfellows are soft Maoists who are most concerned with being transphobes and supporting. Um, and supporting, and supporting Russia. Russia. Not, of course, yeah, yeah. Those those are the two big ones for those guys. So he's currently well, like informal. MAGA communist here. Yeah, pretty yeah, much. So he's he's formally in a relationship with the CPGB ML. Um, so Harpal Bra's kind of tiny. Oh yes, 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 yes. Yeah. I saw them recently. Uh, guys, you get the Stalin banners out at May Day. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And they all just like no one has a good haircut in that whole that whole organization. And it's rare to find no good haircut in a lesson. Like, there's, there's always someone on a street store who looks presentable, right? Not, yeah. not. Fun. So, so that's interesting because in the United States, MLism is basically divided on cultural lines, and there's uh, an extremely uh, culturally, I'll say conservative to be nice, um, section that thinks we need to like. Tail the Tucker Carson vision of what a worker in America is, also pretending it's the 1950s. Um, and then there's another group of, of, of MLs that are actually in the, the, the CPUSA who basically just have the same talking points as Democrats. Um, so it's, it's, it's a very strange... I mean, I, I'm sure people will get mad in the comments and tell me of some other like Maoist organization... Uh, one of the things that's happened in America is the Maoist organizations, which have very distinct identities and identitarian tendencies, have all kind of collapsed into vague China, maybe Russia, maybe not support. Um, whereas, historically speaking, they oppose China. <laughs> like, and, uh, um, so that's that's kind of a new development. Um, what's what has happened in the United States is like. I mean, I know this sounds insulting, and maybe it should, um, that amongst younger millennials and, and Zoomer generation people, there is not a lot of political membership, even in these sectarian organizations, mm -hmm. but there is a lot of identification with memes about Marxism, Stalinism, etc. And, and I think memes is accurate. It feels very much like a seminal milieu to like... Uh, uh, I'm not saying this in terms of content. I'm saying this in terms of distribution before people get mad at me. Uh, it seems like a similar milieu to the radicalization on the right in America, which happened through internet forums more than any, like any organizational success uh, that may have happened. And there was organizations that came out of that and exist now, but uh, I, I do not think the majority of Marxist Leninist I, I, I meet, uh, are in the RCP or the CPUSA or any um, of these organizations. Um, PSL is a little different. PSL is has branches in almost every major city and, and does focus on uh, like Republican controlled states. So you'll find them out here in Utah and in the South and whatnot. Uh, but even there, it, it seems to be mo they mostly tied to student activism, decarceration activism and stuff like that. Yeah, I think that's that sounds about right to me from what I can perceive of the US movement online. Um, 
it's very meme brained and it's very um yeah discordant apart from a few outliers and most of it's not organizationally kind of solidified anywhere interestingly the the first the, the kind of first tendency that you've noted among the mls the socially kind of conservative um you know Pat, Pat Sock, they call themselves, isn't it? Something like that. Yeah, Patriarch Socialism, Mega Communism, Mecca, Mecca Stalin. They call themselves lots of stupid things. <laughs> 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 go, yeah. Patriarch Socialism is like the least weird of what they call themselves. So, right, okay, <laughs> <laughs> that's worrying. Um, <laughs> but um, yeah, no, I, I think that similar tendency does exist in Britain. But it's interesting how it's diffused. So some of it has been organized, um, which is important to note. And that's through Galloway's new outfit. So you have the CPG BML. You also have the Workers' Party, who do very little. They were founded in around and responding to the Brexit referendum in 2016 um, and have a similar sort of views um, to the Patsock tendency with certain elements de-emphasized, um, which would namely be the patriotism is there, but certainly not as explicitly, I don't think. They tend to do it with signifiers rather than words, in my opinion. Um, so like the Workers' Party logo is a, a kind of riff on the RAF logo, but they wouldn't like go where, where patriotic socialists to you. Um, but th those guys are a little organized um, and do do a lot of cultural war baiting and stuff. Do you have a a it's hard to say I and mean, because one the, you have your own, you have an actual fascist tendency and party and the way that the United States not anymore but you did I mean you have yeah. Mosleyites um uh whereas we've had actual like we've had several fascists we've had the silver shirts we've had arguably the second and third clan uh we've had various neo nazi groups but we also have a weird you, not uniquely American, because it's also found in Russia, um, but esoteric hit, uh, esoteric Stalin Hitler stuff. Like we have a Nazi bold tradition that goes back to Francis Jockey to the fifties. That's real. It's never been, it's never been super influential. It's always been a bunch of weird esoteric uh, fascist weirdos. But uh, even even in the fascist movement, but it is a real thing that has a historical basis here. Um, and patriotic socialism doesn't go there, but it occasionally flirts with overlapping with parts of it. Um, and we also have LaRoucheism, which mm -hmm. if you have it, you got it from us, uh, which is from the Spartacist League, which are our most orthodox orthodox trots. But Larusism is not Orthodox Trotskyism. If anything, it's 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 anti-Trotskyist, uh, and it's anti-Marxist. Although its current form tries to hide that. Um, so, I mean, it's interesting you mentioned that because, so I think it's again the same group, the CPG, BML, and the Workers Party. Um, since Miss your your darling Mister Maupin, I believe. Um, oh Steve yes. Flirting more for a long time. Okay. <laughs> Since he started more openly flirting with LaRouche, he's been doing um, joint joint um, podcast things with like the bras and stuff. Mm -hmm. So I think that tendency is open to it, but perhaps more aesthetically than anything. Um, I think there's kind of two things to say here. I mean, one, the thing which will stop the Workers' Party from getting anywhere near that is the fact that so many of them are first generation immigrants. Um, so a lot of people in this, in our version of patriotic socialism, are Indian nationals or Bangladeshi nationals or Pakistani nationals. Um, so, so interestingly, that's that seemed it's a weird coalition here of uh, of longstanding people who are who have who are white and Asian immigrants and specifically Asian uh, Asian in in both the British and the American sense of that term. Um, immigrants seem to be big in that scene uh whereas there the, the don't seem to be a whole lot of i have not seen a lot of like black patriotic socialists i th they may exist i'm not saying that they do not but i have not seen them 
um, where there are a lot of black Marxist Leninists, but their tradition tends to be Maoist or, or strict CP USA. Um, so it's that's a that's a that's an interesting difference, but it's one that's mirrored here. I mean, it's it is it is strange how how much that is the case. The other thing is uh, there are, you know, we Maupin has a has a checkered relationship to to Duganism. But we do have very tiny people do I, I do they are not major political movements in, in the United States. But we do have a Duganist far right that are all ex Nazis. Um uh so like uh new resistance in, in, in the United States is they used to be American third positionist, now they're new resistance, American fourth position. Um and if you know what third positionism is, you know what it is. Uh so we have that, and some of them seem to be trying to do entryism on this mega communist entryism. <laughs> um, but again, other than the than the Center for Political Innovation, there doesn't even seem to be real organizations attached to these groups. Oh, yeah, I mean, yes, there's the Larucheites. There's two different Larucheite uh, groups. There's the Schiller Institute, uh, which I think actually technically in Europe and gets a lot of funding from China. Uh, not uh, when I say from China, I don't mean from the Chinese government. I mean from uh, Chinese investors and uh, LaRouche Pact, which is more. It does stop the steel stuff um, in America. Uh, so uh, but the history of LaRouche is actually opaque, even the people who study it, because it's not actually quite clear that it's ever been its influence, like both its critics and its supporters seem to believe it was more influential than I have evidence for it to be. Um, do, sorry. Go ahead. Uh, we do have a kind of slightly analogous thing. Okay. Uh, which is the the kind of legacy of the second revolutionary communist party. Um, ah, yeah. See, I have been touched by them directly, so I know all about them. Um, that, that makes it sound like there should be a police inquiry, Derek. Uh, maybe there should be. Um <laughs> No, I mean, I just worked for for a left wing publishing house where they would like they would publish with them, and they've gotten into America that way. Um, and yeah. uh, not just one person. I mean, people seem to blame this on Doug Lane, but it's a consistent thing going all the way back to the you know early zero books. There's always been R R RCP people like James uh, James Hartfield. Uh, yeah, James Hartfield was publishing with them when Mark Fisher was still alive. Yeah, um, James Hartfield of the Brexit Party. Yep. Um, um, uh, of getting cock uh, cock foundation funds as well. That's that's oh. been openly acknowledged uh, oh. here in America. Yeah, he was funded by uh, he got some funding by the Koch brothers, as did uh, other former members of the RCP. Uh, we mainly know them though. We don't know about like the RCP's history is kind of obscure to Americans. We more uh, we more know them as spiked that annoying British libertarian magazine. So um, they split from the tendency that James and I were involved in in uh, the late 70s, early 80s. Late um, 70s, yeah, 78, I think. Yeah, late 70s. Over crisis theory, I believe. Is that right? Arguably. So they're pro-crisis. <laughs> I mean, what are the weird... Th are they pro-crisis theory? No, we, we, we are the most pro-crisis theory motherfuckers you will ever meet. Yeah, no literally. Pro <laughs> theory so, and well, I mean, it. other than our Paul Maddockites who uh, are also super fucking crisis theory heavy. Yeah, I mean, I, th I think we were the only, like, originally post-trot, nominally ML organization that had Paul Maddock as, like, mandatory reading <laughs> um, for for members in education section sessions. Um, uh, at least at least that was what I was uh, doing when I was a uh, city organizer. But anyway, um, yeah, so they they split i mean a lot of it was personal stuff because basically you couldn't have two uh academics in a trot group that small without them tearing fucking lumps out of each other so yeah. for and his his lot um buggered off and formed uh you know a, a trotskyist party with the name of britain's first trotskyist party that kind of you know flashback try and claim the the the, the great institutional legacy kind of thing um they started off kind of interesting but weird so they did some uh quite militant anti-fascist stuff at the time when the national front was largest and you know you could argue that actually anti-fascism was a, a movement priority in a way that you just simply can't argue now 
Um, so ironic in hindsight, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, genau so. Um, they did, they, were, they followed our tendency in being quite militant on the Irish question, um, seeing it as a, a, you know, Brits out the, um, the, the armed struggle against British rule in Ireland is, you know, legitimate and deserves the, the, the support of British communists, um, kind of et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but they took on first some like weird aesthetic choices. So they started wearing suits all the time, like the old American PLP. Um, the famous quote from, uh, oh, I can't remember the dude, but he's a satirical writer on British Trotskyism, wrote a book called When This Pub Closes. Um, uh, he said, look, you know, they, they, they always look like they're more, that they belong in a wine bar rather than on a picket line. Um, and as time went on, their positions got kind of slightly weirder and weirder. Um, so during the miners' strike, when, um, you know, the majority of mine workers clearly would have supported strike action, um, but the government were trying to draw out the process to prolong the strike for as long as possible so they could stockpile coal. Um, and so we're insisting that the Mine Workers Union hold a ballot on strike action, which would have basically delayed the strike and allowed that the government to be in a stronger position for it. The National Union of Mine Workers um, weren't stupid, so didn't fall for that. And the RCP basically uh, condemned them for doing so, said that they were anti-democratic for not holding the ballot and basically made this their point of principle. You know, this was for a democratic workers movement. You know, the the mine workers leaders are are basically scabs for not consulting their members on a strike, which affects their members. So like shit like that would start coming out. Um, they lost some court cases, as I understand it, through their magazine, started taking on some kind of external funding. Many of the members started working in PR and then kind of over time, a, a left-wing Trotskyism shifted to a libertarian socialism, just shifted to libertarianism. The weird upshot of this is you've got former RCP members now appointed to the House of Lords by Boris Johnson. Um, I remember some of our comrades doing a march against a commercial, like a, a, a large landlord, like a, a big like a company, which is a landlord in London and the CEO who they were targeting act were people that they were, they were targeting in this action was someone who had been in the party with them in the, in the seventies. Yeah. The, the RCP second, uh, second gen has always read to me like a weird mixture of what we would now call Maggie communism. Uh, uh, but also, uh, neoconservatism, and in America, those people hate each other, but it's it's a similar tendency. And LaRoucheism is similar in that LaRouche actually had some, although no one really knows how much, influence on the Reagan uh, mm -hmm. administration's executive staff. Uh, but it's unclear if it was significant influence or if it was just like played up because of Star Wars stuff. Uh, for those who for those of you who are not in your 40s star wars was this weird attempt to build an anti-nuclear space program uh so we could contra nuke the soviet union from the moon or something it wasn't really from the moon but it, it's it wasn't that different from that and it was a boondoggle of which uh lennon roos was supportive and seemed to have had some actual influence but we also have our neoconservative tradition and uh which you know parallels French Maoists going to the right more than anything weird like this. The the RCP like spiked is such a strange thing because you're right. There's a there's a libertarian communist element of it that just becomes eventually right wing. There is it gets really strange when we start seeing it as a tendency in America is actually around the uh, actually around the um the uh, the Balkan Wars is when mm -hmm. they start having influence here um, and that's when Spike starts getting brought over. But my, my first encounters with Spike online were in the libertarian and paleoconservative world. I was surprised when I learned that they were Marxists and even more surprised when I learned that I worked with a place that regularly published them and had colleagues that were affiliated. Um, so, you know, I, I know all about them now. Um, <laughs> and, but their politics, even from the libertarian standpoint, doesn't make sense to me because lately they've taken, I mean, uh, they seem to have ties to Orban. Um, that I didn't know. Uh, yeah. So Faridi uh, works for MCC Brussels, which, I mean, is one of the key people oh. in it, which is a think tank that has uh, some funding from 
from hung from Hungary. Um, so it's it's a real thing. So it, it's it, it's it's a weird melange. I don't I don't always get them. They they were easier to predict in their libertarian days than they are currently. So Faraday spoke this week at the National Conservative Conference in Britain, which is yeah. our attempt to import more American politics. Yeah, uh, well, and... And he gave yeah. a talk on nationalism, um, and it, it was just completely fucking incoherent, uh, yeah. right? But it, what was really amazing to me is, like, why does anyone want to listen to this guy? So so here's <laughs> a, here's the funny thing about, about national conservatism. It's our attempt to finally do red Toryism. So, so it's it's kind of like what you're getting is America's bizarro view of British conservative and European conservative politics back at you. Like, so you know, it's kind of like if you uh, are an American eating at a Japanese American style restaurant in Asia and are totally confused because, mm. you, uh, but but there is a sense in which like, um. British conservatism is actually a bigger influence on, on the national conservative movement um, than, than it ever was on any prior. Uh, although, let's be fair, it's usually the Canadians' fault. And most of our reactionaries are like Canadian exports anyway. Um, I mean, we have our own reactionaries, but they sound better doing it. So um, that's only kind of a joke. So uh, I've just, I've yeah. just realized. So we 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 wanted to talk a little bit about Trotskyism in Britain in the last ten years, right? Yeah, um, we haven't got to that really. Like, and I, I'm thinking. So we talked about left unity, and left unity was um, funny as fuck in terms of the dance moves it made people do, but it also largely kind of centered around the the smaller of the trot groups, and actually the ortho trot groups, really. Um, so it was um, groups like Workers' Power, uh, Socialist Resistance, kind of. Um, you know, people, 100 people tops, right, in each of those. Um, so maybe maybe it just might be worth talking about um, the real the real blunders and downfalls of the of, of the big wigs, um, so particularly the the SWP, the Socialist Party, and the, the trot groups with a larger uh, kind of either institutional base or basis in social movements and their interactions with with Corbynism and other things. So, what were your what were your kind of main questions around that, Derek? Well, I mean, one is, I had people protesting SWP speakers in South Korea in 2013, so apparently it pissed a lot of people off. But there was also a lot of weird maneuvering. One of the things that that is awkward to talk about was like. There's a lot of scandals about the SWP stances on things like Islamism, um, which was actually the split that caused the ISO and the SWP to one of the reasons uh, to, to formally split off, even though that split wasn't that substantial. Um, and then there were the, 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 the sexual harassment and, and other kinds of sexual assault scandals, which got a lot of press in America and then the ISO had its own. Um, so what were it's, is that, you know, is that with what brought it down or is it more complicated than that? So James, do you want to come in first or shall I? Uh, you go, you go. Okay. So the first thing that I will say is that um, on my jogging route around near my house, I pass a number of lampposts which are plastered with stickers saying don't work with the SWP. Mm -hmm. um, I don't live in a student area, student area. I run through a kind of partial student area. So that's a thing which is still a big barrier to them. The fact that there's a, a, a kind of huge amount of fire back on this. I was at a demo uh, last year against the, 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 the kind of draconian policing act that the government brought in um, where the SWP donated a sound system. And about half of the demo was just young students on an open mic slagging off the SWP on their own sound system. Um, they're really, really struggling with it. However, it, it is always kind of deeply complicated what had had happened. So the SWP had really focused on two recruiting and organizing tactics. Um, one of those was an institutional recruitment and influence drive focused on the 
uh, some of the larger trade unions with a relatively unorganized rank and file mm -hmm. where they thought that they effectively could form blocks within individual uh, union branches to influence policy on a ground level. Um, uh, and on the other hand, through these front organizations, which had large institutional support and allowed them to present themselves as part of a um, almost community leadership in bourgeois terms. So you would have anti-racist organizations or anti-cuts organizations, which would be led by the SWP, um, along with your local church, your local mosque, your local synagogues, leaders, um, you know, primary schools, uh, youth groups, kind of all of that kind of stuff. So that was one of the things that they, they tried to do. The other recruitment tactic was just what all the trot groups do, which is like keep trying to recruit these students who you can take, take in, basically use as workhorses. Um, and, and then they, they kind of split out a little bit uh, at the end and maybe you keep one or two and that will be fine. Um, in regards to the latter group, they spoke to them in the language that they understood in order to recruit them. So they were kind of incredibly right on a barn, um, all kinds of gender politics, race politics, LGBTQ plus politics, kind of et cetera, et cetera, and painted themselves as being, you know, they were the most um, sensitive to the issues young people cared about on the left. And that's how they, they got those guys in. Now, in the middle of this real kind of pivot towards, I, I mean, I, I would call the outcome of it a pivot towards identity politics, but if we're being generous, it's a pivot towards what your constituency is, is most concerned about, right? Which is, that's a legitimate thing to do, however you want to do it. Um, in the middle of that, there emerged these, um, these very serious allegations against their national organiser from a very young woman comrade, um, which it became clear had been covered up by the the executive committee or people on or near the executive committee. I don't want to be be slanderous, but you know, that it's very clear that some some people who had very high positions of power um were covering up these these allegations against Martin Smith. Um now there's no what happened to that young woman is disgusting and Smith should rot in hell, right? But with the facts at our disposal, it is clear that maybe 12 to 15 people acted horrifically in terms of perpetrating acts of this kind or helping to cover those up. Mm -hmm. um, the very visceral response that you got to it um, was a... Um, and by, by visceral response, what I mean is people started treating the SWP like if you got within five minutes of them, you were physically at danger. Like I have been in planning meetings for demos where people go, we need to stop the SWP showing up, not because it will make us look bad, but because it will make women in our group unsafe. Right. Um, and that response, I think, largely came from the fact that people who were in or close to the party had felt personally betrayed because they had been fed, you know, this line, you are committing to something which upholds an impossibly high level of virtue. And they had found out in the most disturbing way possible that it didn't. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that led to a, a large generation of people who went on to be influential activists in other movements and in the Corbyn movement as well, or in the Corbyn search, um, having this very, like, I guess, almost traumatized relationship with the SWP. Um, and, and in the kind of the, 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 the cultural moment that we were in with, with stuff like Me Too going on at the same time, that response was very easy to communicate to others. Um, you got around the world. Exactly, exactly. Um, whereas the, you know, the, the, the kind of, the facts of the case are horrific, right? And there's no way of getting around that. But the facts of the case didn't because what they showed is that that, that really disgusting behaviour occurred in the executive committee and in Birmingham. It had nothing to do with an SWP branch in Cardiff, right? Um, so, yeah, I, I think that was, that was part of it. There's also, like, I'm not sure there was a clear idea of what the SWP was for by that point. Mm. And that really changes your incentive models for how you 
conceptualize your relationship to something which is deeply flawed in whatever way it's deeply flawed. Does that right. make sense? Absolutely. I mean, the, I can't think of a socialist organization that hasn't had uh, a sexual harassment or sex scandal, but it, I can, except for maybe interestingly, you mentioned uh, the CWI not having a problem. I, I actually have never heard of a, I'm going to knock on desk. Uh, I've never heard about that with salt either. Um, but every other group has a similar scandal, but with, with Trotskyist amount groups, it tends to be disastrous and in, in the thing, whereas with, with the DSA or the CPOSA, it tends to be a lawsuit. Mm -hmm. um, and it does have effect. It is scandalous, but it's not, it's not going to destroy the organization. And that's not just about size either. No, it's about professionalism and the difference between that and really strange relationships with people who are kind of your friends and kind of not your friends at the same time, right. um, which festers in the sect um, a lot more. I, I do think that th those kind of questions for the SWP were a double killing blow in the sense what Luke said is correct in that respect, but also th the context of complete Trotskyist failure within the women's movement, um, complete Trotskyist failure within... Um, anti-racist movements, uh, anti-disablist movements, so on and so forth. And then to kind of put out this rhetoric that suggests finally, yes, you're going to address it and then fall short, will have also hit older comrades within the movement. And I think that's really important to kind of note because there were a few older comrades of mine that I was speaking to around the time of the SWP scandal and that basically said that this is the same wound, but now it's in the open. Um, and I think that that's very important to acknowledge, and it reflect it does reflect something institutional in the failures of Trotskyism, but in a very media orientated, explosive way, um, which is to do with personality clashes and the way in which those organisations are run and how media trickles out of them, and so on and so forth. Um, but yeah, it didn't seem to help that the the ISO had a almost identical kind of scandal that was similarly limited, but went on for six years. What brought it to light, I think, um, is that uh, Haymarket Books became a multi-million dollar uh, uh, operation that had corporate oversight, um, even though it was a it was a nonprofit, and and that meant that they could not legally get away with the kinds of things that you normally have in sex. Um, Although the extent of the corruption in the in the uh, ISO actually seems to have been even less than the SWP, like it was not that many people implicated. But th this seems to be a constant. I mean, like the IMT in Canada just literally had, and the Ca and the Canadian Communist Party both just literally had similar scandals recently, um, in the last year. So this seems to be a, a constant thing, and I I, I tend to think that. You're right. It's professionalism as much as anything else, because you in a lot of these sectarian forms, you have. I'm not saying that they're religious, but you have similar dynamics to religious groups where there's a lot of both friend, peer friend professional uh, barriers. There's not really good grievance handling mechanisms and there's cults of personality involved personally, too. And all those I things think, play together. I think when an organized. So there's the point, there is the point that on an organization of that scale, it becomes incredibly difficult to construct a grievance mechanism, particularly yes. when you are just juggling loads of other things with burnt out people mm -hmm. doing all of them. Um, I do think that the religious comparison holds up particularly in terms of the vulnerability of people that those organizations recruit. Um, so in a sense, it's kind of horrible to say this, but it shouldn't be surprising in a culture and a society that's so violent against women in general, and that this happens so generally, um, that like that occurs in smaller groups of isolated people who organize together all the time and provide many entries for people who are manipulative in either a pathological way and many circumstances for people who are not that but will be horrible rank opportunists and do awful things too so you know those things are kind of social problems compressed into a really extreme representation of them yeah I, also, I, yeah go ahead also i mean just from from so i was at university i was actually in the communist party but with swp people trying to recruit me 
um, kind of four or five years before all this this broke through. And what I noticed from both me and the other people they were trying to recruit is that effectively what they were doing a lot of the time was taking isolated, weird, um, emotionally immature young guys and saying, you know what, son, you're the fucking future of the revolution, right? Just by basically being angry and hanging out with us. Um, now, luckily, I'm from a Communist Party household, so that was never particularly appealing to me. Um, but but that was what they were doing. And what was the compound, one compounding element of the crisis in the SWP is that there had been lower uh, ranking um, crises of sexual violence in branches running up to that, which, in fairness to the SWP, had not been covered up. Right, they'd been dealt with by a grievance procedure, and it had worked reasonably well. But there had been quite a lot of them, and it had been very clear that that was related to the way in which recruitment had been taking place and the culture of branches. Um, yeah, and so in many ways, what you had here is you know there were women, women comrades all across the country going, um, "Okay, this guy got really gross with me, or this guy assaulted me, or what have you," and he's been kicked out, and I'm. I'm glad he's been kicked out, but this mirrors so closely this shit that I know so many people have been going through with. That's that's the it compounds a sense of betrayal. Effectively, it becomes a you didn't mean it really thing, um, and so you almost have this kind of coming together of like a grassroots problem, which was facilitated by the way that the party operated in its recruitment policies. Um, which then was compounded by a fact that when it happens at the top, it's covered up. So it's, you know, it's allowed to happen and then someone is punished at the bottom and it's allowed to happen and nobody is punished at the top. Uh, and with a persistent structure due to the prevalence of sectarianism as well, which does prioritise recruiting aggressive young men primarily so that they can deal with those sectarian confrontations. So... This is my experience of Marxist groups, regardless of the tendency. This is a trans Marxist group problem in America that 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 really size deals with, kind of, um, but but really only that. Um, I mean, there's horror stories that come out of even relatively famous groups like, I don't know, the Black Panthers, but we're in a time period in a context where that stuff wouldn't have been outed. But um, we don't have groups, really, that haven't had those kinds of problems. And I think there, in general, there's a tendency. And you, you, you two may agree with me or disagree with me. I think this is true for our marginal politics, whereas you're in uh, marginalized sectarian politics you have to have people who are ideological motivated, which leads to an overdependence on students um, and an overdependence on the ideologically alienated. Um, uh, and this is also true in, in right wing groups. However, in right wing groups, A, some of the stuff is normalized and not complained about, and B, uh, they have authoritarian ways of handling it. Um, so, you know, just I happen to know that. So it's. It, it, it's, it seems to be an interesting predicament of, of left-wing groups who want that kind of active militant culture but and are often appealing to, to young men um, are um, and yet don't really know how to socialize, the, socialize them for this. They don't have the capacity. And, and, and society in general, as we mentioned, kind of doesn't. Um, and then also on top of that, you have structures that are not conducive to, to, to grievance being across the board. One of the biggest ones I actually think is like this fetish Trotskyist organizations have for upholding the Bolshevik constitution of 1921. Um, I don't think that helps. Um, it certainly does not. No. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, it's uh because I have noticed things that have more tendencies and stuff tend to handle this a slightly better, although small groups are always open to it. And I do think that's, I, I think it's a doubly compounded problem. Uh, what do you make about the claims about the, the, the SWP's relationship to Islamism? Is that overstated? Is that like, is that like a right wing myth? What's going on there? 
happened for a bit and then it stopped. That it so the thing which is really visible about it was Galloway's respect coalition after the Iraq war, where right. Galloway broke away from the Labour Party on an anti-war platform. The SWP and the Socialist Party joined with him, um, at least initially. It then became clear that Galloway, who was uh, MP for a largely, um, uh, an area with a very large Muslim population who were, of course, very upset about the uh, about the Iraq war for understandable reasons, was more willing to tolerate conservative Islamic politics now, I'm not an expert. I haven't met and talked to all of these people. Um, I'd be reticent about just saying Islamist with a, a a kind of wave of the hand. My imagination is probably some of them would fit into a definition of Islamism. Some of them would not, but they were certainly conservative politics, which were very influenced by religion, if that makes yeah. sense. So yeah, they could uh, be secular, but influenced. Um, the SWP were happy to go along with him on that. The Socialist Party weren't. So there was a falling out between them, which had quite a high press output, if I remember correctly. Um, Again, I heard about it in the States and abroad. So, yeah. 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 So shortly after that, uh, during one good election, um, the SWP were prepared to live with it. After one bad election, they were no longer prepared to to live with it. So uh, it's weird, like the SWP and the SP both broke from respect on a point of principle about conservative Islamic politics. Um, it's just the SWP, the, the SP, the Socialist Party did it um, before it could get them anything, any kind of gains. And the SWP waited until it had exhausted anything it could do for them before ushering a point of principle. Well, technically, it led to the ISO leaving the IST, too. So it's which which meant that, like. The ISO had this plausible deni- and, and did until it collapsed, this plausible deniability relationship with the SWP. Like they push SWP lines, they act like the SWP, um, but they're not in the I they're not in the International Socialist Tennis anymore. So uh, they're not technically a problem. And I, I would also I, I am using the language that was used at the time. I'm actually quite sensitive to the difference between Islamists and uh Salafist and uh, as it gets thrown around in America, a lot Wahhabists, that's a very specific uh, thing. And I, I realized that you could have fairly conservative Islamic politics and be actually a quietist um, or, or something. Uh, I lived in Egypt for long enough to understand that. But I'm uh, framing it as the way it was framed to me 10 years ago. That's, you know, uh, that's the way it was framed. Um, and... Uh, it, it it's an interesting problem. I mean, one of the things that I would say that makes it so that makes Trotskyism so interesting is that its limits to growth are also part of why it doesn't go away. Um, so like the the super orthodox Trotsky groups or the super idiosyncratic Trotsky groups. So like you don't have a Norfite group, for example. I don't think you have anybody who has any relation to David North, but. Um, but for us, that's the World Socialist website people, for those who don't know who they are, and the Socialist Equity Party, also confusing because that. We, we have individual members from the World Socialist website. Um, right. We occasionally. Um, but they're very weird guys who will just sort of stand up in a meeting and tell you to read an article on the World Socialist website and then sit down. Yes. Then, yes. Yeah. yeah. I've, I've met more of them at demos in Germany than I have in Britain. Yeah. Wow. Uh, <laughs> Well, what's interesting about the, I mean, the Norfites used to actually take an ultra, what would be considered an ultra, an ultra left position on unions. They have moderated that kind of now back to a sort of Trotskyist union bureaucracy critique, as opposed to the entire form is capitalist, so we can't do anything with it, which was their uh, uh, original critique. I used to work with someone who was a, who was a Norfite. He later became a Alt right would be the nice word for it. Um, <laughs> uh, he wrote for Talkie Mag for a while, so you know how that goes. Um, but so we we have them, but, but the, the the organizations. I'm not the 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 various Spartacist League splits. A lot of them are still around. Um, at least the IBT, the International Bolshevik Dependency, and I believe the Spartacist League itself is still around. You guys don't have those either, do you? We do, yes. Oh, you did we give them to you? Were they, was was this one of the they, few they, times? They are all um, so the 
the Communist League, which is the IBT in uh. Britain, um, they have like one English guy in that I've met. Um, but all of the Spartans I've met are Americans. I was going to say, the Spartacist League seems so very us. Yeah. Like... It's, I, I, I kind of felt like they should have been, been bringing me a Big Mac. Um, <laughs> but no, so we have, um, so I actually went to a, uh, uh, we, I, I, I had a meeting with the Communist League in Manchester, uh, all two of them. Um, they're, I mean, they're nice people. I really like them. Um, and actually they are, they're both organizers in um, a particularly large and particularly militant union branch. So they're doing God's work there, right? Um, but their meetings, as I understand it, their public meetings are are fairly ill-attended, um, despite the fact that they lay on catering, which nobody else does on the left and should be a big kind of draw for union meetings. Hey, holy crap. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah, really, really nice catering apparently as well, actually. But um, so yeah, there's like two of them. The Spartacist League we there's two things they're really good at which is coming along to other people's meetings and asking very tangential questions yes um and they will do that for all large left and, meetings in london but nowhere else and really caring about marginalized positions that no one really even wants to deal with such yeah. as like their stance on nambla um yeah th yeah that's um we we had luckily we we no longer have that in the british left but it's it's within my political lifetime that we've got rid of it we have uh, mostly gotten rid of it too i think and i don't think the ibt does that i think that's a a classic that's a classic coke variety of spartacist league yeah. um the other thing though in the spartacist league in america is, is famous for producing both the platypus affiliated society which i i I, I come out of, so take that as you will. If I, can I, I go to their enough. reading group in Manchester. Yeah, I'll never they, be they run a good reading group. I, yeah. I don't, uh, despite other people, I don't always agree with them. In fact, I often don't. I think I uh, don't agree with them more than I do. But I do consider them still to be leftist in some variety. Um, whereas they also, you know, the Spartacist League also produced LaRoucheism. So uh, it's... It's known for entra its intransigentism, breeding very strange ideology. It also produced uh, indirectly a uh, anarcho-primitivist turn anarcho-fascist tendency called a called a Tasha in the United States. <laughs> that, that, that's probably four people actually who were ever involved in that. But the Spartacist lead brand of militancy apparently has a tendency to mutate. Um, uh, but I, I, I figured if anyone else had them, it's because we gave them to them. That doesn't seem to be a tendency that happens anywhere else. Uh, do you? I, I do have to ask. So, are the French uh, Trotskyist tendencies uh, ex? You know, do they exist in 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 the UK? Because that is something that's always confused me. They don't really like French Maoism has existed in the United States, but French Trotskyism never caught on here. I don't think so. I've certainly never come across anything similar to it. James, maybe... I met one guy handing out some badges um, from a French trot party. Can't remember which. Um, at the Miners Gala in 2018. Miners Gala is a big like workers' event in Durham in the north of England. Um, yeah, that's, that's the only experience I've had. Um, yeah my mate's partner is french and is a trotskyist and she's not been tempted to get involved in any of the the british organizations mm -hmm. um, now that might be because she doesn't see enough political similarity it might be because she can't be asked it might be because have you met a british trotskyist Do you really <laughs> i mean that makes sense guys. um i was i was going to to Kind of like Mandel and Belgian and French Trotskyism has a has an intellectual influence here, but uh, and it it was picked up both by the ISO and the USSWP until recently that now the Pathfinder tendency, whatever the hell that is, how and I believe all those people are eighty, the, um, but so it was represented here as a thought tradition, like like Ernst Mandel is super important for us too, but not as a political tradition and and then 
what is fascinating to me, despite the large number of of, of Latin immigrants, uh, Mexican or uh, Argentine, uh, Argentine is actually fairly so big, uh, British, uh, uh, Mexican, uh, Latin American Trotskyism has only really come over as a sad meme in the form of Posadism. Like yeah. it, its actual traditions are not really picked up here, even on the Latin American left. Um, and I, I'm told, I don't know if I can prove this, that Latin American Trotskyism, particularly in Argentina, is the only Trotskyism that is growing right now. Everything else seems to be in massive retreat. Uh, and that makes perfect sense to me. I haven't understand, understood why there's still Trotskyists after the fall of the Soviet Union. Like, um, I think there's also a problem for us, and actually this is something you've talked about on other shows, mm -hmm. um, but Marxism in general, all intellectual trends in general, are um, characterized to some degree by methodological nationalism. Yes. Right? Um, in England, that turns into Little Englanderism. Yep. Um, really, really sharply. So, so Orwellism for Americans. Um. Yeah, I, mean, I think that's unfair. But like every, <laughs> every, okay. um, I actually quite like Orwell, but like I think, you know, um, I, I I like the world police really talks about like why why the why the British will never have the problems that Americans do because their working class is perfect and ours isn't. Um, it's like <laughs> yeah, so we, we don't we don't quite have that, but it's it's this idea that um, even even and especially the internationalists, mm -hmm. right? People who talk about internationalism all the time imagine that the world is just a series of Britons and everybody must think and act the same there as they do here. So despite the fact that there was a, uh, you know, a burgeoning Trotskyist movement within France, for example, um, which is literally just over the water, right? Everyone right. went on their school trips there. British Trotskyism imagines that the great truths of society were found, you know, first by Lenin and then by Ted Grant. And nobody else need get a word in edgeways. Um, when there are international conferences, and I know that because, you know, they used to put sessions of those online and, and as a student, I'd listen to them and stuff. Um, you'd get speakers from other countries to be like, yeah, hey, we're international. But it was always people involved in struggles from cities that really could be transposed into the West Midlands. You know, um, <laughs> it was very, there was very little engagement with the kinds of struggles which would look different if they were in Britain. Um, and so ironically, you'd end up with stuff like, um, you'd end up with this, this big kind of focus sometimes on, on um, urban Latin American politics, large industrial cities, which are being deindustrialized, um, you know, gentrification slums, what have you, instead of like battles in Italy, where there would be cultural variants in there or the influence of social actors that you just wouldn't have in Britain. And so people would have to think to understand why they were in solidarity with it. That's, that's an interesting issue because it's actually, it is both true and not true in the U S Trotskyist case simultaneously. I mean, because I would say U S Trotskyists like U S Maoists are actually tended to be better at international issues than say the CPUSA was except when it was talking about stuff that specifically they had to because a common turn or whatever told them they had to but when when it came when it all the American left Im imagines that the America's racial and class problems are universal and uh, it doesn't help that the British British soft left society and and european soft left society even when they're complaining about americans which they are constantly doing do so on the terms of american liberal left identity politics i mean explicitly it's so much so that like when i i had a german professor who was telling me how bad the united states was and i told him tell me his opinions on american literature and i'm like you got that from the new yorker yeah, it's just like you, you know, you are actually marrying us back at us and our own, our own uncomfortability with ourselves. Ours is what you're expressing as your version of anti Americanism, which I think is kind of funny. It's but like we have our own racism. Yes. Oh, right. I've been trying don't to explain. Need to import it. Right. I've been trying to explain like when British, when British people and American people talk about black and Asian, we don't mean the same thing at all. Like, <laughs> um, and and sometimes I'm like, 
and actually it's sometimes really convenient to to appropriate american style understandings of racism because then you cannot deal with your actual conflicts in your home country like so i think that's actually really really crucial to um oh my i mean it's really yes. important, and this this is coming from my workplace, and I, I imagine it probably mirrors some stuff in yours as well, right? It's really important for middle management anti-racism strategy. Yes. Because if you're, particularly in Britain, if you can make race a symbolic problem, uh, as a middle manager, that requires you to do nothing because it's a symbolic problem, but yet you can interpret any behavior you don't like within that symbolism. That's even true for the United States. Like like in here, we have we need to get teachers who represent their communities. They go to the South and hire um, black professionals in a, in a community where most of the black students are, are Somali and Ethiopian refugees uh, and Haitian refugees. So it's just like, it's like, it's, it is the most superficial form of representation that you could possibly do and doesn't actually deal with local issues in the, in the United States being, you know, what a third of a continent um, and huge, uh, you know, as I like to remind people, all Britain fits in what two States, two, two East coast States, one West coast state. Um, uh, even now um, it, we are also like, we have trouble talking about our own issues because the national uh, the national framework is so consolidated, even though we're regionally so variant. Um, and it doesn't help that Europeans basically think New York and California are the country, or they think a stereotypical version of the Deep South is a country. It's it's kind of funny. But you guys um, think that London and the Southeast is a country? Oh yes, I, totally. If we think about you at all, like let's let's be completely fair. Most of us don't, but. Um, but yeah, no, the, the cultural differences um, between England and England is something that is not real represented here. Basically, our view of, of your culture is the same as your view of ours. It comes from our media hubs, and that means it's, it's uh, England and the South. And we know some of us who are more cultural know that like the North is different, but we couldn't tell you how. The broad uh, amalgamated north. Yes, it's like according to Americans and Southerners, is about two thirds of the fucking country. Right, um, um, which is everywhere that isn't London, basically, um, and not Wales or Scotland. Yeah, so, um, uh, which I'm sure really pisses you off, just like it does, um, and that's fair. Um, I, I find it funny. <laughs> <laughs> So I mean, me and James are North truthers, uh, right? So <laughs> we we have a definition of the North, which uh, is only accepted by people in that part of the North, which is yeah. it starts at the line between Blackpool and Scarborough. And anything south of that is the Midlands. So like Manchester, Liverpool, you're not in the North. I'm sorry, you never will be. Um, like... You dream, but... <laughs> so, so I'm a South truther. If you're north of South Carolina... Are, are west of Louisiana. I don't consider you Southern. So Do you, you know. want to found an international, Derek? Yeah. <laughs> founded on flimsy <laughs> shared commitments. I have sort of thought about like translocalism as a way to do internationalism because we also like, I'm really proud of my very particular, a fucking sub-region with a state mate. Like it's like, like, like I'm from one strip of area and I'm like, fuck all those people that way and that way and over there too. <laughs> But I have I have uh, I have broad solidarity with the world as long as you're not from Alabama or North Georgia. Um, so. Yeah, I, I got you. I got you. Yeah, um, yeah it's it, it is. And it's funny that you say because I'm like Manchester. That's the Midlands. But do we believe the Midlands are real? I don't know that I do. It's uh, a residual category. Right. Right? Um, Anyone from the Midlands hearing this would literally like fly into a fury right yeah, now. I'm, I'm probably going to get it just like that well it's funny though because people forgive me for all the bad shit i say about england because i'm just normally slagging on you um and i will just say this this is actually my slagging on the english is mostly for the americans um who tend to worship you for some weird reason that i don't understand um 
Like, I'm always hearing about how, like, oh, there's a real left in Europe. I'm like, is there, though? I've been to Europe. I don't know. Like, <laughs> if you're going to say there's a real left in Europe, right? Like, I'm not sure that, you know, like, I don't know. I don't want to do a no true Scotsman, right? And be like, well, there's nothing that I would want to call the real left anywhere that I've been. Like, mm. but, you know, so comparatively, yeah, maybe you can say there's a real left in Europe. Why would you worship Britain, though? I mean, for yeah. fuck's sake. Like, if you go to France or Germany or, or Italy or what have you, you will find a much more consolidated, much more vibrant, much more capacious anti-capitalist movement than you will find anywhere in these kind of squalid hell islands where we seem to, you know, every year this country becomes more and more authoritarian. And what do we do? Like, we write some bad PhDs about it. That's all that happens. You know? Every year the state gets more authoritarian with nothing to exercise its authoritarianism on. <laughs> they, they would love for there to be a left movement just so these laws make sense. Right? <laughs> like, um, I yeah, realise... Uh, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, no, that makes perfect sense. I mean, I think that's actually becoming clear to us in the States. I, I do think that. The, 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 how fast the British left seems to have collapsed um, I think the speed might be misleading a little bit. Um, and I, I think this is possibly because of the similarities people draw between the Sanders and the Corbyn moments, whereas I don't think the similarities are that clear cut, um, to be quite I don't honest. Think they're actually there at all, to be yeah. completely, to be, <laughs> to be completely <laughs> honest. Like, um, I, Although I do worry that the post Corb, uh, the Coast Sanders reaction will actually probably end up similar to the Corbin reaction. But like, uh, Corbinism was both bigger and smaller simultaneously, I think. And that's hard to explain. But, but it was um, the last great yawn of social democracy in Britain. Right. <laughs> <laughs> actually, going back to Trotskyism, mm. there's one really decisive thing um, that has led to. A, a precipitous decline of British Trotskyism in Britain over the last 10 years. And uh, British Trotskyism has one consistent and deadly enemy who it never recognises as its consistent and deadly enemy. And that is the soft left. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So socialists in the Labour Party who are not Trotskyists maintain their position and their influence over policy effectively as the 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 kind of the trotskyist lion tamer so when they don't feel like they're getting their way in the party they will integrate and use trotskyist arguments and activists and organizational structures to put pressure on the right of the party um effectively to negotiate with them over the terms of policy when either they've got a negotiated settlement that they want, or alternatively, the right is got toying with the idea of fucking all of these leftists out altogether, they will stab the Trotskyists in the front sometimes. And then what you'll find is 10 years later, the exact same thing will happen because the British Trots have not learned their lesson. So this happened in the 80s with... Um, with uh, the rate capping thing in... Uh, so Livingston was involved in this, shafting um, the, uh, the, the Trotskyists... Labour Party people in South London. Uh, later, with the militant tendency being kicked out, that happened again. Um, and most recently, in the Trotsky, uh, sorry, in the in the Corbyn phenomenon, um, it happened through momentum. So all of these trot groups kind of uh, dispersed themselves into moment momentum and into the Labour Party. Many of them were banned from joining Labour itself because they had previously stood against or supported campaigns against the Labour Party, or alternatively had been in groups which were considered to be contrary to the um, to the views of the Labour Party. The Labour right has a fairly, um, fairly well put together anti-entrism policy. Um, now, these guys were integrated into momentum um, from its early days. They helped to build it as a front organisation. They helped to um, effectively give it the organising capacity that it had. And they were involved in, in uh, you know, effectively making it the force that it was because they, these are very trained, very seasoned organisers. They were able to do all of the shit that you need to do around elections because they've been doing that stuff for years. As soon as it became inconvenient for the soft left 
who had the majority or momentum because they will always have the majority over something like that. As soon as it became convenient for them to be gotten rid of, momentum got rid of them like that. And so effectively what you now have is these group of Trotskyist organizers who have gotten rid of their party infrastructure. They now only exist as a network who have, um, you know, four years of their lives effectively pissed away and nothing really else to go back to and no way of making decisions about how they go forwards. That's an interesting parallel to the United States because we, we not just in the DSA, like we in general have a similar uh, issue of our relationship to Democratic Party activists and, you know, dual carters or whatever. But one thing that makes it both easier and hard, I mean, Bernie Sanders is a, a, a key example of this. One thing that makes it easier and harder, though, is uh, at no, our parties are not by by European standards. Our parties aren't parties. They don't have those kind of like they can do. Party membership in the United States is nominal, um, and so you can kick someone out from caucusing with you uh, officially at the at, like the congressional level, but you couldn't kick out activists from claiming you because our like, you can't vote in certain ways in the United States without declaring, uh, you know, a party option, even if it's, even if it's formally declaring nothing, depending on the state you live in, um, which, which in some ways does mean that it operates kind of differently. Like there, we, there no one's going to be kicking out um, activists who, who do any of this. Um, however, we still have a similar problem with the democratic party and the soft left turning tail. Like the relationship with the DSA to like justice Democrats, for example, is a similar relationship where when things get hard, they turn tail are uh, the squad, which I mean, is not all DSA members uh, are endorsees, but is mostly um, they also, they, there's just no way for the DSA to even begin to hold them accountable. Um, so that's a similar a similar problem. I guess it's the other difference to me though is like well it was an interesting thing. Corbynism in some ways was was the first time the British left actually looked like the American left in its voting trends. Um which is like it had a working class constituency but it's mainly younger, etc. Um, that's not true actually. Oh, interesting. You, they didn't have so, a working so, class constituency or it wasn't mainly younger? I mean, it had, it had a working class constituency in the Marxist sense of a working class constituency. Okay. Right? It, wasn't, it wasn't the bourgeoisie or the petty bourgeoisie who were, who were you know, organising in this. And Labour held together the majority of its, um, its working class base, even in the seats that it lost. It was okay. really, uh, you know... Uh, people who were no longer working or small business owners who who proved the kind of switcheroo here. they got those things story. But in terms of the Corbyn activist base, as opposed to um, the voting base will change city on city because we're highly regionally differentiated. Um, but the in the larger cities and uh, larger city voting blocks within the activist base, the age of Labour voters actually went up slightly. Mm. And, and and the age of Labour Party membership went up slightly, as you would probably expect, because what Corbyn was trying to bring back was effectively a soft left Labour programme from the 1970s or 80s. Right. And so old Labour Party voters who have, you know, would basically think, well, it's not the party for me anymore. Blair fucked it. They got rid of clause four. Like, I'm an old whatever. Um, I'm an old lefty. I'm either not going to vote or I'll vote green or whatever. They came back. Um, it wasn't a kind of, it was an influx of young people into street level activist roles because they were infused and, and they, you know, they wanted to be, um, they wanted to be at the forefront of these things. But in terms of people actually rejoining the party or deciding to get up and vote for Labour, that got older under the pressure of people who'd felt betrayed by the party for for 15, 20 years, saying I no longer feel betrayed by it. Mm. Yeah, that's 
the that dynamic's interesting because the way it was portrayed in America is that it was the first time it that the British left looked like the US left in both the good and bad sense of the term. But I guess that was we didn't actually see all your exit polls, and they are not usually fairly represented to us. Uh, mm -hmm. What we got was a media narrative about how um, the uh, the working class had just been left out of British politics entirely, which True. now is fair enough. Um, uh, one thing I would that I find interesting about this moment is that, in some ways, I think. It, the U.S. left doesn't have a strong history. Like, we have an appeal to the New Deal and maybe to the Great Society. But we don't have a workers' party. We've never had a workers' party. Like, that. Uh, Taft-Hartley is, is almost specifically designed to make sure the traditional way of forming a working party is closed off. You, There's no way for unions to coalesce that way. Um, and so that's a... That, that's a, a major difference. And thus, we also don't have a hankering for a soft left 70s policy, which I which I, I knew that Corbyn was pushing. But if I am frank with you, I thought was chaotic. Um, because the, it, you don't have that industrial base anymore, nor do I even see the ability to build it up in the same way. Um, no, I think that's true. You know, yes, so I mean, it, it was it was really an interesting politics of difference. It was attractive because it was a break from mm -hmm. the kind of uh, the liberal centre consensus politics which had come before. It was exciting because finally there was somebody who was talking about, um, you know, issues of inequality and class and socialisation in a way that people weren't before it didn't need to make sense mm. to be an exciting uh, alternative on that basis. Now that Jim is back, I'm afraid I'm going to have to go because I'm already late for another call. Right. I'm really sorry about that. That's no, okay. Would it be possible to plug two things super quickly before? Absolutely. I nice one, mate. So uh, the first of those is the Marxism and Disability Network, um, which is a monthly meeting and uh, research seminar um that happens online. Um, please look us up. So far, we've had really, really interesting talks on uh, disability labor and time. I did one there, which was a critique of uh, Adler Bolton and Vicant's health communism. I believe you've had Adler Bolton on the show before. So if yeah. anybody heard that and wants to, to hear a, you know engagement with her work, then, then that'll be uh, up online soon. Um, and we've, we've also had some really interesting stuff on applying uh, th the theory, uh, theoretical insights of Tronti and Pantieri and, and Italian workers Marxism um, to question of disability politics. In general, we're an attempt to bring together um, organizers and activists involved in disability politics, but who are interested in insights from Marxism, along with Marxist researchers who are interested in disability politics as a sphere of anti-capitalist organizing. Um, it's chill. It's a really nice group. Uh, please Google us. We have a mailing list you can sign up to. You can come along to any of the seminars and we're going to be um, kind of toying with some some kind of uh, interesting entry level publications coming out soon. The second, and I hope this is resolved by the time that you publish this, uh, but at the moment, uh, 140 workers um, at the University of Brighton, including teaching staff, um, admin workers, uh, technical workers, uh, all that kind of stuff, are uh, apparently the management is attempting to make uh, that number of people redundant. Currently, the whole of the philosophy, history, literature and art departments have been told that all workers there are at risk of redundancy. Um, there is a petition to rally support to let management know that they're basically pissing away an asset. There's lots of actions going on on the ground in Brighton, as well as uh, around the country by distance learning students in support of the workers. Um, if I send you the... Uh, the link to the petition, Derek, would you be cool to pop that in there? Yeah, I would totally pop it into the notes of the show. Not a problem. Nice one, mate. All right, well, I'll see you boys in a little bit. Take it steady, guys. All right, you too. Take care, Luke. All right, uh, James, I guess we were talking about how Corbynism um, uh, does not actually, both does and doesn't reflect uh, Sandersism, whatever that is. Yeah. Um, one of the things about Sandersism, I think it is different. It's, it's actually less coherent than Corbynism, but it's because 
I mean, there's less of a tradition to appeal to, right? Exactly. There's no, like, you can't really appeal to the Great Society because of the Vietnam War, yeah. right? Um, I guess you can appeal to appeal to the New Deal as long as no one knows anything about it. <laughs> um, uh, I mean, that's, that's relatively true for most of the Labour Party's history as well, but yes. <laughs> Well, I mean, it's just funny what people think is in the New Deal, and then I'm like, that's not there, that's not there, that's not there. It's like a bunch of Banco stabilizations and a public works project, mate. Like, that's all it is. <laughs> like, um, uh, I mean, there's some other things. There's the National Labor Relations Act, but uh, which I don't think, I think Americans now realize, but I don't think they did realize, doesn't cover most unionized workers anyway. Um uh, which is there's so many exceptions to it railroads uh government employees uh state employees education nursing nursing does have uh some representation on the national labor relations board uh but um is subject to other laws etc and so forth um so yeah we don't have that tradition um we also have a more strained relationship with uh, with the Democratic Party, although it seems like what has happened here, and I, I, this might be controversial, and I want you to speak on it a little bit, but that the American Marxists have, have actually filled the role as a soft left in making reconciliation with the Democratic Party seem ine uh, inevitable and perpetual. And I don't just mean the DSA, like I've seen Marxist intellectuals uh, who have historically been hostile to the Democratic Party capitulate under the Biden administration in ways that do not make sense to me. Mm -hmm. um, how has the how has the British left handled the failure of Corbynism? I mean, because like we talked about a little bit last time, there's been this absurgence of workers' militancy in uh, in the UK, but we haven't seen a left that's really been able to benefit or help or or merge with it at all. No, so I mean, I think to, to set it in context, that Corbynism comes at the end of a long decline for both um, the traditional CP and for um, the British Trotskyist movement as a whole. So mm -hmm. following the kind of heights of the 1980s for Trotskyism, membership halves before we get to Corbynism, um, and that's quite significant. Is tied to a lot of campaigning activity. They lose a lot of members through campaigning, um, effective campaigning as well, which is an interesting thing that goes back to setting aside being Trotskyists um, in order to do things. Um, but I think that since then, um, the upswing for Corbyn was interesting because I think that was more of a consolidation of the sectarian milieu than an upswing for the mixed sectarian milieu. I think that's very hard to kind of quantify because obviously a lot of these organizations don't release membership statistics or incredibly quiet about that kind of stuff but i don't think there was that socialist growth that people associate with corbyn i think there was a lot more of them in one place than would usually happen because they had a joint project to throw their ore in together um rather than kind of anything more substantive i think luke was outlining the problems within momentum that british trotskyism faced mm -hmm. with the knife to the front um, again. And that's one element of it. Since then, we've seen, I mean, most organizations, I don't think Socialist Appeal have been yet, but I think most other organizations within the Labour Party have been expelled. I know the Alliance for Workers' Liberty was expelled. Um, another one was expelled quite recently. Um, and so they, they've kind of been forced out of the Labour Party, which was, uh, a, a, for a huge section of Trotskyists, was their primary tactic in, in quiet periods, um, that and union work. Um, or one or the other. Um, and, and so that, that certainly damaged a lot of organizations quite a lot. Um, other damages have been dealt as well. It's, it's kind of a strange twist of fate that prior to the Corbyn election, the old militant tendency, the S Socialist Party, were in an electoral party alliance with the RMT union, mm -hmm. um, which was called the Trade Union and Socialist Coalition. Um, I think it initially had um, members from Respect and possibly and some SDPP involvement, um, but that dropped away, and it was just the Socialist Party and, and the RMT. The RMT quietly, very respectfully, I would say, left that post Corbyn, um, and are now advocating 
a vote for Labour. Um, mm -hmm. And well, if not explicitly, but would say anything but the Tories. Um, and the Socialist Party have therefore lost their kind of electoral coalition, which has basically decimated their possibilities uh, as electoral candidates, um, which is another strategy kind of out the window. Social movement wise, since Corbynism, what we've seen is a lot of um, semi-organized street movements, more than more than I think is usual for Britain. We've had um, Black, Black Lives Matter during the pandemic. We also um, obviously imported from the United States, but did manage to address certain issues of racism within Britain. There was quite a lot of trying to draw out the lessons in Britain in a comparative sense, which whilst not wholly going into the difference between the analytics is still more useful than not. Um, then I would say- Although I would ask how, I saw Labour Party ads about Black Lives Matter that didn't seem to deal with British racism at all. And- Oh, the Labour Party, the activist milieu did. Okay, yeah, yes, that makes sense. Um, it's just, I, I saw the Labour Party trying to use American BLM for, I was like, how does that have any, like, <laughs> cool in, in, in the UK? Like, I just don't understand what you're even trying to do. But anyway. I, th um, I think it's just straight up branding in, in their view on that line. Um, yeah, it's quite gross. Um but then we also had the Kill the Bill movement, which was, I guess, more like, although it initially kind of arose from the Sarah Everard vigil in London, which was attacked, um, um, kind of at the same time as the Public Order Now Act was unveiled, um, the serious attacks on the rights to protest in Britain, did become a kind of joint um, project of some Trotskyist organisations, some other kind of organisations um, in campaigning, depending on where you were in the country. Um, and, you know, that campaign did some good work, but as by and large fizzled out, I didn't win any of the victories that it was trying to even momentarily, really. Um, and, and things like that. So there's occasional attempts to do the entryism into stuff. Oddly, not with the environmental movement, so not with Extinction Rebellion or um, Just Stop Oil and things like that. That seems to have kind of wholly separated itself from the Trotskyist milieu, um, despite being the most consistently active force that they could appeal to within the country, I think. Um, and then just kind of attempts to turn up to other demonstrations and moments and, and kind of do that, um, as well as pursuing their old tended, their old, their old strategies where they can in unions a little bit, um, electorally a little bit, but we are looking at a continued decline and uh, like to illustrate that. Um, in 2017, Stop the War Coalition, which is a bunch of Trotskyists, um, Socialist Workers Party, particularly, but also the Socialist Party, um, founded in response to the Iraq War. I have criticisms of the campaign at the time, but skipping over those. Um, in 2017, that had 52 branches. Now, last year, it has 25. Um, so we're talking about like losing about half of their branches since the Corbyn period for a a joint kind of front organization, um, which is the only kind of consistently formed anti-war campaign they've had for a long time. Um, and that's, yeah, that's cut in half. So I think that that shows quite a perilous decline. Politically, they're kind of not, they don't really have a home a lot of the time at the moment, I don't think. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's interesting because the consolidation thing does seem different than the U.S. Yes, we had a consolidation of the sectarian left kind of after Occupy into the DSA, but the broader population of uh, popularity of socialism is actually a growth. Mm -hmm. Like, it is not just a consolidation. It is a, because it is so generationally correlated. Like, uh, Gen X, like, I mean, you might think for my podcast, there's a lot of uh, Gen X left. There's not um no. statistically speaking um and th there is a a huge growth in left-wing movements that said uh all the major left organizations that i follow seem to be posting membership declines of significant amounts and the dsa is kind of cagey about their they, they used to be very good about reporting their numbers now they're not um, always is fine <laughs> yeah, um uh, but uh, it seems to be uh, declining in active membership rather quickly and precipitously um, uh, from a growth at the beginning of the 
uh, pandemic uh, to to you know a little under a hundred a hundred thousand to probably probably about eighty thousand now active membership or so and and uh, this is a joke that makes more sense to Americans but getting off the the role of the DSA is like leaving the Mormon Church it takes a while to do <laughs> um, uh, so and you kind of have to actively do it. So uh, those numbers may not re- like the, even of numbers of, of members sh- not in good standing um, may not even are in good standing may not actually be be particularly accurate and up to date um, because of the way they count membership. Um, a lot of other things seemingly have just declined into either the DSA itself or gone away. The, there's rumors of a massive increase. Uh, in the CPUSA, and I will say I see more people identifying with them online than I have historically, but the CPUSA uh, has been tiny uh, until rel- until the Sanders campaign, ironically, uh, shortly after it in 2016, because they opposed it. Um, because they basically were, we made fun of them for just being like, you know, they don't officially endorse Democratic candidates, but they maintain a uh, popular front strategy, mm-hmm. um, pretty much identical to what they did in World War II. Um, so they endorsed, they well, excuse me, they don't formally endorse anybody, but they strongly supported people supporting Hillary Clinton, etc. Um, in the past. <laughs> um, uh, now they don't seem to be doing that anymore, although it's unclear. They do still seem to be largely Biden supporters, but the entire left seems to be kind of there. Um, except for the MAGA communist left, et cetera. Uh, and MAGA, com- they don't want to be called leftists, and I don't consider them leftists either. So I shouldn't call them left, but whatever they are. Um, uh, so I, we're seeing ideological fragmentation and disarray. Yeah. Um, but in, in Britain, it looks far more terminal. I mean, from, from my outside standpoint, it just seems like, I think part of it is what you... Uh, argued in the beginning that we misunderstood the strength of the British left in the first place. Yeah. Um, yeah, I do think, so for example, Trotskyism, I wouldn't say there's ever been a Trotskyist movement in Britain. There have been m- movements that have been disproportionately influenced by Trotskyism, but wouldn't define themselves as Trotskyist movements. So for example, like the biggest example and the most successful example I would give would be the poll tax campaigns, again, to go back to that, because that got quite a huge class basis behind it and was initially started by the, the militant um, as a slow sequence of meetings and campaign events and so on and so forth that gathered huge support, but it outgrew them. And in order to do it, they had to stop being Trotskyist. So Trotskyist influence, but not a Trotskyist movement by any metric. Um, and I think that's that's a big contradiction in the respect because on the, whilst we can say that, as Luke referenced earlier, we, we also don't have any organizations that are not Trotskyists at this point. So you end up with a position where it's never existed, but it's dominant. And that's a really strange contradiction to be in because in the lulls between where more organic protest activity or union activity occurs, if you do street politics in Britain, you are going to come up against the, the, the Trotskyist left and they are going to seem like either you're going to merge with them, you're going to work with them, or they'll be aggressive if there's a position that they want to defend that you disagree with. Um, And that will seem dominant. And that was how politics appears in the day in, day out activism. So it's also going to dominate our discourses, um, and which which comrades in the US can see. But actually, socially, it doesn't mean that much, like at all. and it gets leveraged, as I said, for reasons within Labour Party power politics and so on and so forth, too, which presents this image of something that's much more powerful than it ever realistically was. And I think the only kind of answer to these questions is that we're dealing with things that draw from really fracturous social bases to begin with. And I think that's important to understand. They're not they're not something I would say is rooted in a class Um and I wouldn't say that we're rooted in a particular demographic of the class. They certainly draw a lot from students, but students are very variable and they tend to draw from quite alienated people normally. Um, and that leaves you with a very fracturous kind of vulnerable political base that can accidentally wander into doing significant things sometimes and has, but by and large um, ends up 
continuing this process of decomposition, which it's never been able to, and renewal, which it's never been able to escape from. But it seems like the conditions for renewal are going away as the Labour Party goes to a more hard right position, as campaigns become less coherent, as um, as kind of economic crisis starts to bite and unions don't have any of the kind of actual power to represent workers' interests that they used to, even within Britain, um, and so on and so forth. And it leaves you with a very difficult situation, um, I think. What I find interesting about this to me is it makes Britain kind of the most acute form of the sporadic decomposition. We can talk about Italy and, and France as where the places are better, but we see similar decomposition patterns, I think. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I am un like, for example, if Macron is to is really to to uh, lose next round next round of elections in France, I don't see Mélenchon being able to overcome Le Pen. I just don't. Maybe I'm no. wrong. But, I hope it, I hope we're wrong, but yeah, I agree with you on that. Um, I also don't know how long the SPD is going to be able to hold on to power in Germany. I don't suspect very long. No. Um, so it's. It's it's very strange. I, I think we're going to look back at this and be like, well, this was a left wing revivalist movement of which, and where a lot of the current lefts of the world actually die, mm -hmm. um, uh, which is not a fun period to live through. <laughs> um, but uh, and maybe I'm wrong about that. But uh, so far, I haven't been. Um, but it has it's, been clarifying. It's it's kind of hard though because like. On the one hand, we can look at because I think what one thing we do within every tendency, even when we're talking about tendencies that we disagree with or whatever, think think have problems, um, we tend to periodize over and over and over again. So a failure doesn't last as long. So <laughs> if that makes sense, so like we talk about British Trotskyism, and there was an upsurge in the eighties and the nineties, and there were successful campaigns over those periods, right? Mm -hmm. But what we're talking about in terms of success is really important to note because the poll tax is the only one that got policy revoked. Um, it's the only one that affected a meaningful social change in direct terms. The anti-Nazi League, the Socialist Workers' Party's anti-fascist strategy, can be quantified as effective in some respects. It certainly had huge popular turnouts and engaged a youth culture and made some kind of gains against racism within kind of broader society but in terms of an advance for the class or for like like a concrete policy or a concrete room for maneuver or an advancement of a party or anything none of those things happened um so the retreat in britain i think has been going on for a long time as it has in the us and we re-periodize it with the, the defeat of corbynism for example as if the upsurge was anything but an aspiration because I don't think it got beyond an aspiration. Yeah, I think it's clear our defeat because we got so thoroughly defeated in the 1920s and 30s. Like, yeah. Um, and then and then buried in the Red Scare in the 50s. Um, yes. You know, um, whereas we have micro resurgences. But even then, I mean, as I like to point out, we're talking about a few hundred thousand people um, yeah. in a population of 320 million. You know, yeah. Um, uh, and even though socialism's popularity has gone up significantly, so, you know, no longer 200 million of those people hate socialists, that's no longer true. Um, that does not mean that there's a viable socialist politics in the United States at all. Um, uh, and, and this seems to be true in a lot of Europe too. So it's, it's, uh, it's hard to say. And, and most of the left ring, um, you know, you're right about the periodization. There's also a tendency to like see each left ring renewal po possibility as successful before it's ever even really launched. Um, as anyone who remembers 10 years ago and everybody who thought that uh, Podemos or Syriza would be a rebirth of the, a rebirth mm -hmm. of the European left. Um, yeah, uh, that has not worked out. So... <laughs> Not at all, no. Um, no, it's a very difficult one. Uh, I think it's something that goes... Like, there's various different ways of explaining it, but all of them are kind of unsatisfactory. Um, right. So you can look at it in terms of cycles of capital accumulation. Um, there's some arguments that suggest that workers' power actually increases in periods of positive valorization. Um, right. Uh, there's 
the case to be made that there's a sort of class decomposition, for example, where people are, this is the end notes kind of theory in a very small potted way of people are spread out more, workplaces are more dispersed, so on and so forth. The capitalist geography politics have changed, um, which is again, partially true in, in like Britain, certainly the industrial working class does not exist in anywhere near the same form as it did in like the 1800s or 1900s. Um, but again, that's kind of unsatisfactory as an answer for why the whole left would decompose in the same way. Then you've got the defeats of international socialism, um, the defeats of like dealt by Thatcherism and Reaganism specifically as forms, again, which do explain something, but don't get at it, I don't think. I think it's one of those things where in the downturn, all you can really do is attempt to find the actual like social forces that you need to find in order to build something and that's not going to come from repeatedly attempting to build tendencies which have already died um it's sad to say but i think that british trotskyism is on its last like violin solo out at this point as much as i i'm not an anti-trotskyist i want my uh i want my audience to know that but uh i think it needs to go yeah me too like i think it um, needs to go like I, I have a lot of disagreements with the Trotskyist tendency. I'm not like an anti-Trot in the sense that I hate all Trotskyists. I agree with some on some things and disagree on a lot of the orthodoxy um, that goes with it. But that doesn't mean I think that they're bad. Um, but yeah, I just think it's become a fetter on any kind of organization attempting to form something new at this point that we all fall into the same model and repeatedly kind of because of the ways those models justify their failures in terms of doctrine, just go on to attempting to refine the doctrine and never looking at the organizational problem as a whole, um, leads to this kind of expansionist drawn out defeat. And we just kind of never need to go no and move on. <laughs> yeah, I, I think, I mean, uh, if anything, my, my call is in general for Marxists to realize that we have to kind of move on from the 20th century learn from it not try to bury it not try to pretend it didn't happen which i think maybe that latter tendency may be a common one these days hmm. um whether or not your mls are your a neo kalskiist there seems to be this whole like let's just get back to the earlier form where it quote worked unquote mm -hmm. um and I don't think I think it's useful to learn from that. I, you know, obviously, I wouldn't be talking to you on, about the history of these things and the revisionism controversy, et cetera, if I didn't. Yes. But uh, if there is a vibrant socialist political tendency in the future, it will probably be Marxist, but it will probably not be any of the forms of Marxism that currently exist. So mm -hmm. uh, maybe it'll come out of China, but I'm not sure about that either. So it's it, that's just my stance on this at this point that a lot of these things feel like. They feel like uh, I f I call them cargo cults, but mm. uh, so it works. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, it's just it feels like oh yeah, the, the, you know, we did this in the past, and let's just keep doing it until they show back up, and no one's showing back up. So nope. Uh, yeah, it's very sad. So uh, James, anything you'd like to plug? Um, I mean, we're on a little bit of a video downtime at the moment we're doing a longer film again um going to be on the cap it's called for land on the capitalist mass extinction um and that will go into the, the the mass extinction which the sixth mass extinction which is distinct from and composed of the climate crisis so it touches on a lot of different eco politics um trying to draw things together to deal with arguments that were in an anthropocene and give a little bit more context to the distinction between the social critique and the scientific kind of way of arriving at that critique. Because I think that a lot of Marxist tendencies tend to dismiss scientific reasoning around why it's a human driven, not a capitalist driven specific uh, mass extinction um, on the basis of Malthusianism or a misunderstanding or a lack of engagement with the science um, and kind of just deploy the social critique without examining where the science is kind of reasoning from so it'll go into that um but that'll be a couple of months a month or two mm, that's, um, that sounds heady i mean i just had matt huber on but i'm also reading uh kohei seto and um yeah i i 
I'm becoming, I'm not Malthusian pilled at all, but I do, I am sort of uh, becoming more and more skeptical of the, oh, it's just totally about redistribution of resources equitably and then we could grow forever mm -hmm. uh, sort of um, thinking. I just, I don't think there's a lot of scientific evidence for that. Um, but we do need to we do need to understand both both debates and arguments. And if we're going to have a critique of the of of you know the scientific, we can't always just talk about the population bomb and other easy to debunk bullshit. So, no, I think I think the core of it for me comes back to if you look at um, kind of I mean Marx's phrase of um, his critique, which is that natural science was without history. If you're going to be able to critique natural science to, uh, to to allow the entry of history as a critical domain, then you can't have a, a Marxism without science. Um, it's kind of the correlation, right? And I think we're falling into the Marxism without science trap quite a lot um, on those problems. Because, um, yeah, the population bomb is really easy to dispute, but it doesn't tell us anything when we do. Um, yes, fair point. Um, well, thank you so much. Uh, Thank you for coming on and um, probably we'll have you on in the future. Um, maybe on these topics once your next movie's built. Maybe. Brill, that would be wonderful. Awesome. Um, been good to chat to you, man. Uh, I am going to have to run now, though. Understood. So. All right. On that note, good night, everybody.